As soon as October 7th happened, the Israeli propaganda machine started going in full swing. Lloyd Austin is reinforcing U.S. support for Israel. The Muslims here, we didn't have a voice. And then, out of nowhere, you come along. Sami Hamdi is here. Sami Hamdi. My dear brother, Sami Hamdi. Sami Hamdi, editor of the International Interest, joins me now. And then you kind of tie it all together. You have power. You never didn't have power. It's roaring even though Israel is pummeling Gaza. It's roaring even though there is a death toll in Gaza. Move, ya ibadallah. Move. Don't be an ummah that does nothing. That's action. That's Islamic. That's what the Muslim ummah should be about. Move. Don't be an ummah that's silent. Move and do something. I know that it looks bleak, but I promise you that those who stand against the Muslims do not believe we're in a bleak position. Allahu <laughs> Akbar. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another episode of the Prophetic Mentality Podcast. I am your host, Amr Mabrook, joined by my co host, Munir, with a very special guest, very special guest uh, this evening, Sami Hamdi. Assalamu alaikum. Sami, how are you? Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for having me. Alhamdulillah. And if you guys don't know by this point, Sami Hamdi is the managing director of the International Interest, a political risk consultancy group. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Sammy, late this evening. Uh, you've been doing your rounds in Southern California, mashallah. We've been uh, so blessed and so happy to have you here, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair for having me, alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. And I just want to preface this by, um, so this, I, did, I was not very like aware of your full knowledge of you know the geopolitical landscape up until like your third episode with the thinking on the thinking Muslim with Muhammad Jalal. And... Uh, I think the biggest thing for me was <clears throat> as soon as October 7th happened and then the Israeli propaganda machine started going in full swing, I felt like the Muslims here, we didn't have a voice. We were, you know, putting up things on Twitter, putting up things on YouTube, putting up things on Facebook, but it was very, I would say it was, to me, it didn't seem very cohesive. Whereas the propagandists, the Zionists, the, the racists, they kind of had their talking points and they were hitting them every single day to kind of drive the narrative home. But then slowly you see attitudes shift, you know, big personalities maybe change their minds. And then out of nowhere, you come along and then you kind of tie it all together. You kind of become the voice that ties this narrative together and it breathes voice back into the movement. So for that, I will say that's probably for me one of the most beneficial things that I've gotten from you so far. Alhamdulillah. Um, and that will kind of segue into today's topic, which is we kind of want to get in the mind of the political analyst. How are you able to look at these geopolitical situations, tie in, you know, different things that are happening maybe thousands of miles away, but you connect the dots and at the same time you're relating it back to Quran and Sunnah. That is a framework that I think many of us would benefit from uh, being able to think this way and being able to articulate thoughts and ideas this way to kind of understand the world around us. So this is kind of where we want to take uh, today's podcast, inshallah. I'll ask you, I'll preface it with one thing. So my, my teacher pointed me in the direction of a book called Super Forecasting. Maybe you've heard of it. It's the art and science of prediction. So what this guy did is he went and he found that he did a big survey of a group of people. Some are experts in the field. so like quote unquote political analysts, whatever else in government. And some are lay people, a guy who retired from like pipe cleaning, a baker and whatever else. And he found that even expert predictions are only slightly better than chance. Like if you just guessed you might have just gotten the same result on what was going to happen in Egypt, Syria, etc. But then he did find there's a group of people who are very good at guessing, quote unquote guessing. They are really good at forecasting. And he had some uh, traits that he said about them. They're open minded. They're intellectual, uh, intellectually humi um, humble, etc. Um, so with that in mind, so you obviously do this for a living. So we want us for the audience, for people in the future, even listening to this. What do you think of? When you get, and we'll give you a case study. Let's say tomorrow, this is conceivable. Iran decides we're going to invade Saudi. We want Mecca and Medina. What is the first thing you're thinking and how do you start laying things out for yourself to do this risk consulting for other people who come to you? I think, first of all, thank you very much for, for, for the generous introduction uh, as well, even though sometimes generous introductions can be quite terrifying because the assumption is that I have done something when as in reality, one should be aware that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives blessings, skills, wisdom and the like. And while I don't claim to have many of those, and that's not an exaggerated humility, it's more an awareness 
that in political analysis itself, the first step is always to assume that you don't know as much as you think mm. that you know. And the reason why you were talking about the Quran and Sunnah before is because at 18 years of age, my father put in my hands the book, The Road to Mecca by Muhammad Asad. And he told me, son, read this before you go to university. And I was very, I was of the opinion that when you enter university, there's only two ways you come out, a kafir or a Muslim. There's no way, there's no middle way. You know, it's, it's, it's difficult. You go straight in and suddenly there's responsibility and mistakes carry a heavier price than they do during your teenage years. When I read Muhammad Asad's book, I came across phrases such as, it is not Muslims that made Islam great, it is Islam that made the Muslims great. I came across concepts where Muhammad Asad argues that when Islam became an inspiration for action, when it drove people out to actually do action, Allah elevated the ummah and made it powerful. But when Islam became defined as habitual rituals and just habits and the like, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took away the power of this ummah because Islam is in its very essence a, a plan of action. When I was 16 years of age, and again, this will link back to your question. When I was 16 years of age, I still had it memorized a big surah that you could show off in front of your friends. So I needed to learn a surah to show off. And, and this is the intention that came. And the reason why I say that is that many people assume that to approach it, you must be pure of heart. The reality is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides whom he wills. And sometimes he guides you even when you're not necessarily looking for it. In Surah Taha, when you're looking at the story of Musa alayhi salam, what struck me as a 16 year old is Musa answers back a lot to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah shows him two signs, talks to him directly. But Musa is still asking to, for Harun to be sent with him, saying his stutter doesn't you know, allow him to speak properly to Pharaoh. Even after he's seen the sign, he says, you know, uh, and I'm reading this 16 year old and saying, my goodness, he's a prophet. He's supposed to obey immediately. Allah punishes those who don't obey immediately. Allah is, is supposed to be strict and the prophets are supposed to be obedient like robots that go by. Why is Allah tolerating that back and forth? Why does Allah say, you know, speak to Pharaoh in a gentle way? I have a joke with my friends. Whenever they're harsh on, uh, with me when I do a video, they say, no, you were too, you, how can you talk about bin Salman or Erdogan or, or this or, or the Libyans this way? I tell them, whoa, whoa, whoa. <coughs> but Allah told Musa to speak to Pharaoh gently. I'm at least better than Pharaoh, I like to think. You can speak gently to me as well, you know? And maybe it's, that, that's something that some other people should consider as well. <laughs> but the point is that you read that as a 16 year old and that stays in your mind, but you haven't put it in a political format per se. All that's done is it's redefined your perception of Allah redefine your perception of the prophets and redefine the parameters within which you're allowed to make mistakes. Redefine the parameters within which you're allowed to feel hesitation, allowed to feel confused, allowed to not know things, but still go forward anyway because they become clearer once you take that first step. When I was when I learned Surah Taha and I felt it was great, I came across somebody who also knew Surah Taha. So I thought I need to one-up him. So I went for Surah Maryam and Surah Maryam you come across you know, Maryam meets Jibreel. Jibreel tells her she's going to be the vehicle for a miracle. <coughs> Allah says that he elevates her. But when the miracle comes, she says, I wish I died and never been born. And as a 17 year old, my reaction was, A'udhu Billah. <laughs> You know, really, you think like, how, how, if Allah had, had spoken to me and shown me signs, I, you know, you, you, you arrogantly assume, and here's the point, with the you arrogantly assume that your reaction would be one of, I will go immediately. But what the Quran is telling you is, no, you wouldn't do that because you also have human attributes. That politics is human and politics is the science of human relations in and of its essence. And when Allah responds to Maryam alayhi salam and says, فَنَادَاهَا مِنْ تَحْتِهَا أَلَّا تَحْزَنِي قَدْ جَعَلَ رَبُّكِ تَحْتِكِ سَرِيَا Do not be sad, Maryam, I've made the earth as a mattress for you and given you the ripest of dates. You begin to accept in political analysis that it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to be wrong. It's okay to assume that you don't know. And therefore the starting position is not that you know. The starting position is, let me take a step back and put myself in the shoes of Muhammad bin Salman. Let me take a step back and put myself in the shoes of Amr or in the shoes of Munir and let me try to see it from their perspective and that's why I think that when it comes to this idea of the premise of starting political analysis the, the book Road to Mecca redefined how I viewed it and later inescapable questions by Ali Izzet Begovic because Ali Izzet Begovic 
the Muslim philosopher King was in situations where he had to apply his Islamic principles to unfavorable circumstances. It was real politic the way he tried to reconcile all of it. The point here, the point here that I'm making is that while it does sound like I may know what I'm talking about, if you listen carefully, I am presenting dynamics and potential scenarios and then gauging whether each scenario will come, to, will come true or not based on those particular dynamics. To give you an example now, back to your example, Saudi Iran, even though it sounds like you asked me, where's your ear? And I did that. But the point is that when it comes to Saudi and Iran, people all are always assess that politics is either good or evil. And to suggest that they are gray is wrong. But I think, you know, Allah says, you know, ayat, uh, 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 that he talks about there are ayat uh, that people when they do the ta'wil, وَمَا يَعْمُلْ تَأْوِيلَهُ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُتَشَابِهَاتِ هُنَّ مُتَشَابِهَاتِ وَأُخَرُ مُتَشَابِهَاتِ The ayah has left me at this moment. But the point is that sometimes there are ayahs that, that appear gray area and Allah determines their intention based on that ta'wil of that particular ayah. When it comes to the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, for example, about Iran, people often say the war in Yemen is horrific what the Saudis have done. What the Saudis have done in other countries is wrong. But put yourself in the Saudi position. Put yourself in a position where we are sitting, all three of us together, with the Saudi Crown Prince. Let's do <coughs> political analysis. What are the threats that are posing on the kingdom? Low oil prices, our economy is based on oil. In 2015, 2016, one sixth of our treasury was wiped out because of the low oil prices. We panicked. We need a high oil price and we need to diversify the economy. How do we do that? We need to wean the dependency on oil. We need an economic initiative. Bin Salman has called that Vision 2030. In theory, there's nothing wrong with that. When you look to your north, you have militias that are allied with Iran. You look to yourself, you have the Houthis allied to Iran. You've got Iran in the east and you've got Iranian proxies such as Abu Mahdi al Mohandas killed in 2019 saying, I want to come after Riyadh. If you're sitting in that room with Bin Salman, do you say that it's exaggerated to fear Iran? It's not exaggerated. No. You believe that there is a genuine threat that, and therefore you will react, react accordingly. You consider your options. Do I trust the Saudi army to help me against those militias? They failed in Yemen in 2009 when Khaled bin Sultan went in and Khaled bin Sultan's career was ruined. He was going to be crown prince and then he got ruined. You don't trust the Saudi army because they've tried eight years against the Houthis in supporting the Yemenis and they failed miserably. So you don't trust your army to do anything despite all those weapons, right? You want to rely on the Americans. You know, do not take the non-Muslims as protectors, mm. except in, and Allah goes in certain seconds. So somebody comes and gives you a ta'wil and says, yeah, 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 you can do it. He twists the ayah a little bit. So you go to the Americans and you've got an American security agreement. 2019, the Houthis hit the oil facility. Americans don't come rushing in to protect you. So I can't trust my army and I can't trust the Americans. But my heart is breaking doing this analysis of justifying bin Salman. But I'm giving an example of how the political analyst is thinking in providing those scenarios. Yeah, I feel bad now, sir. No, 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 no. no, no but, but you know, it, it's, it's to appreciate that, yes, while I criticize bin Salman, I understand where it's coming from. Yeah. So you, you can't trust the army. The Americans are not rushing in. Khalas. The Iranians are getting closer. They're talking about Mecca, Medina, the Houthis now establishing themselves in northern Yemen, all the like. And at the same time, Iran is facing a lot of, you know, embargoes and uh, the Americans hitting their economy, but it's not stopping them. But from it's doing not anything. stopping. It's not, in yeah. fact, in fact, yeah. instead of stopping them, Biden sends his team, Robert Malley and these others, yeah. to talk about a nuclear deal with the Iranians yeah. that will entrench the Iranian influence. When Obama merged Iran's militias with the Iraqi army, Obama was saying, I'm not interested in going against the Iranians. Here is a reward. He allowed the militias to merge with the army, meaning the army effectively going under the, the pro-Iran militias or like. Put yourself in the position of the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The economy is in crisis, existential crisis, probably only a decade before you really need to diversify. You don't trust your army. You can't trust the Americans. And then somebody turns up like Donald Trump and says, normalize ties with Israel and I promise to protect you from the Iranians. Normalize ties with Israel and I promise to give you a nuclear program. Normalize ties with Israel and I promise to bring all the American companies that have the money, the technology and the innovation to Vision 2030 to rebuild your economy. At this point, it's not far-fetched to assume that Bin Salman believes this is a bargain. I don't have to like the Israelis, but if I normalize and they manage to help me deal with all of these existential crises, then why not? Then when Sami comes along in a podcast and says, no, believe in the Ummah, Bin Salman says, let me tell you about the Ummah, that you have in Qatar, al Udaid base, where the American planes are willing to take off in order to bomb Saudi if I do something wrong, and the Qataris would support it. The UAE has its military bases. American planes would take off from there and they would hit me, and the UAE 
would support it. You talk about an ummah that has brought the American military bases not to protect them from Western countries, but to point those guns at me in the event that I ever choose to force them into a position that they don't like. Put yourself now in the position, Na'udhu Billah, can't believe I did all this, but, but in the position of the Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, suddenly the option of normalization seems reasonable. So we bring Shakira in. <laughs> <laughs> the issue here comes now, and this is where the Islamic side comes yeah. into the political analysis now. You do all of that argument and you get to that conclusion that sounds reasonable and rational. Then I open the Quran and I go to Surah Hud. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he describes Ad and Thamud, he doesn't describe them as people who are poor. He doesn't describe them as a people who were weak. He doesn't describe them as a people whose economy was failing. He describes them as a people that they had innovation that hadn't been seen in the world at the time. That they were economically prosperous. That that they were spread, that they had a lot of people or the like. So when the Prophet goes to them and says to them and warns them that Allah will punish you if you are not just, that Allah will punish you if you do not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Allah will punish you if you do not do right by your neighbor, that if you don't uphold the just rights of everything, everybody else, Allah will destroy you and they don't listen to Hud and Allah destroys them, implying it doesn't matter about the economic prosperity or political power, rather it is as Ibn Khaldun said, Al -adlu asasul mulk, that justice is the foundation of dominion. So you're telling me that we should do all these left-wing things, Shakira, Nicki Minaj, Mariah Carey and the like, in order to build a prosperous economy, but I'm reading this Quran that's telling me that it doesn't matter the economic prosperity, if it's built on injustice it will be destroyed. That's a political fact that feeds into the analysis which leads to the conclusion in my reports that while Vision 2030 makes sense in terms of economic development, the injustice that is being spread in Saudi Arabia means that the social contract is one of bread and circuses and while even though Saudis may feel there's an economic improvement, they won't tolerate living without dignity for many, for many years and we've seen that in other countries as well that it's not a compensation. That leads you to a qaida, like a general framework in which you're interpreting how the political analyst is thinking in terms of the regards to the Quran or the Sunnah or the like. And, and the point here being, and I won't go on too long about this, is that when you've analyzed all of that, you come to the conclusion that bin Salman's idea that normalization is what leads to the prosperity is wrong because it's an unjust thing to do. But then you start considering what are the other alternatives. And the reality is there are other alternatives. The first, you keep Iran at bay by offering a rapprochement process. That's what bin Salman has started to do to offer the rapprochement process. But Wait, he, what is that? where you tell the Iranians, you make a deal with them. Mm -hmm. Get off my back for five years, and here's the exchange. You sign a treaty with them and you say to them, get off okay. my back, give me time. You know. Secondly, you change the attitude of your population. You tell them, guys, I know you lived off patronage for a long time, but now we're under serious situation. We need to raise a generation that is ready to defend the Saudi borders or the like from this incoming threat. My point is that there are other ways through which you can actually progress. There are ways in which you can reach out to Turkey. Already he's doing it to try to bring about Turkish weapons, the Bayraktar drones, to try to advance his technology and get Turkish know-how. He could go, go, go around to Malaysia or to Pakistan, try to build these little alliances here. There are many ways he could do it. The reason he doesn't do it is because he has certain ideological fixation on the idea of building cities that look like Miami. But the overall concept here, going back to your question in terms of political analysts, where does the Quran come in? Is because while it may look rational, what they are doing with regards to Vision 2030 or the threat of Iran or the like, Allah is reminding you from high above that what sounds rational actually leads to destruction. And that's why Ibn Khaldun says And the reason Ibn Khaldun says that oppression leads to destruction of civilization, he actually explains it in his book. Because we, I, I used to think of it when they said it when I was younger as a maxim, that it's a spiritual thing. It doesn't matter if you have good economy, Allah still destroys it. That's not what Ibn Khaldun said. Ibn Khaldun said that when you have oppression, what happens is that even if you have a strong economy, eventually people stop innovating. Because they say, what's the point? I become rich and I get all these lands and the government just takes it from me. So they stop innovating, they stop progressing. And then what ends up happening is you have less products on the market. With less products on the market, people go elsewhere, elsewhere to find it. And then you have a brain drain and a brain talent. Then your market shrinks further. So the local population believe your city is no longer important. So they also abandon that city. And it ends up this spiral which leads towards the destruction, which is why justice is the foundation. Because justice means if I do right, I'm not punished. I can do what I like. And I'm only punished if I do wrong. So these maxims, they help to temper the worst of political analysis. 
they help to temper the idea of pragmatism that we have to do this because it's the only way. What the Quran is telling you is yes, that might seem the only way, but Allah will not reward that way. So we have to think about the harder choice, which is how to establish justice, to be patient. And that's where you get into the seerah. That's when the seerah starts coming in. Where you look at how the Prophet Muhammad used to handle his relations with the Sahaba or how he used to approach politics. And here is where you start having maxims that perhaps sometimes, you know, it throws you a curveball. So I remember being younger, looking at when Umar ibn Khattab anhu, after the Prophet ﷺ dies and he's talking to Ansar, there's an interesting statement that he makes where Ansar is saying one Khalifa from us, one Khalifa from you. And Umar al-Khattab says, but the people will not follow your tribe. They will only follow somebody from Quraysh. And Ansar acknowledged that. Now that sounds like tribalism, but that's rather an astute awareness of the political dynamics of the time. Where Umar al-Khattab is concerned about stability of the state and they will only follow Quraysh. What do you make of that? What I interpret from it is every society has its unique dynamics and you need to appreciate that whenever like you're moving forward. But the reason why I mentioned that in the seerah and even the way Prophet used to mm-hmm. forgive some sahaba when he entered Mecca and he forgave them and he managed to win them over or the like is because when you see those maxims, they temper the worst of the political analysis. There are people now talking about we should normalize ties with Israel. And the reason some people are entertaining it is because as we showed earlier, if you follow it from A to B, you can get to a situation where astaghfirullah it does make sense. But if you don't have the political maxim that the Quran is telling you in which it's destined to fail, because there are other people who've normalized before. The Qataris in 1996 were the first to establish ties with Israel willingly. The others were peace treaties. The Qataris were the first to invite the Israelis in 1996 to push back against the Saudis after Hamad bin Khalifa toppled his dad and the dad said to the Saudis, please rescue me. The Saudis were getting ready to invade, to restore the father. The son said to the Americans, I'll give you the largest military base and I'll establish ties with Israel if you get the Saudis off my, off my back. And the Americans rushed in and they established the military base and they established the ties. But the Qataris haven't really benefited from it. They still ended up on the blockade on 2017 under Saudis in the UAE. And even now they're wrestling with the UAE in Washington or the like. Without going too long on this, but, but, but the point is that you analyze politics and you use the Quran to try to reorient whether those politics will succeed or not. I know that sounds vague, but when you have case studies, it becomes much more clearer. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. <laughs> I, I literally had, I was like, oh, I'm going to ask him about five different lenses to talk about it. Quran, Sira, Quran, events, history, and economics. And he hit all five of them. Mashallah, <laughs> sabbatical law. But, but, but even the Quran, so, so even, so I give an example. So, you know, everybody reads this, the ayah. And I give an example just, just of the thinking. So everybody reads, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلُ مِمَّا دَعِي إِلَى اللَّهُ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا وَقَالْ إِنَّنِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ That when you give, that the, there is no better speech than one who gives da'wah and does good deeds and says, I am from the Muslims. And you read that and you think, okay, da'wah is wonderful, da'wah is great, da'wah is etc. And I didn't realize this until recently where two years later, Allah says, اِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِهِ أَحْسَنْ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنُهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيٌ حَمِيمٌ وَمَا that conduct yourself in that which is best for it may be the one with whom you have an enmity today, tomorrow becomes your warmest ally. Again, a friend next to me read it as a spiritual ayah. But you read it and you think, okay, hang on a second. So right now we're all calling out for Palestine. We're all shouting loudly about no. Palestine. And we're all loudly, and some people are saying that there's no point to it. So what we are shouting and so what, what comes afterwards, you know? And you know, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Woman ahsakun min da'il Allah. So we know this is the best speech because we're calling to that which is right, which is calling that which is just, which is part of da'wah. That this is for Palestinians or the like. That ayah idfabilati ahsan, as if it's responding to those who say there is no point. Because Allah is saying, conduct yourself in that which is best. So be tactical, be clever in the way on how you are using your speech to convey the cause. And Allah is almost reassuring you that yes, it looks like everybody is against you. It looks like the odds are, it looks like they're attacking you and they're repressing you. Remember, he says enmity, there is enmity. It's as if they're coming against you the same way we're seeing them clamp down on campuses or the like, or trying to restrict the reach on social media or the like. But Allah is not only telling you that you might win. He's saying, you know, the person who is trying to shut you down on the other side, you know, some of those who perhaps before supported Israel. Tomorrow you may see them, they are supporting Palestine and they end up your closest allies. Who are the people who did the sit-in in Congress? Who are the ones who did the, 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 the who blocked the White House the, in the front? The Jewish community. It was the Jewish community. So those who we thought we had an enmity with ended up our warmest allies. Because let me put it bluntly, if it was Muslims who did the sit-in in the Congress, the reaction would have been very different. But Allah knew that and he delivered those who we thought were, had the enmity towards us. And instead Allah made them our warmest allies by warm being that they are carrying those voices to the Congress and making it very difficult for the other side to call us anti-Semites. And here's where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you the rebuke straight afterwards. 
telling those who say that there's no point the, this result is not for you guys who aren't patient it's not for you who because you can't see the result you don't mobilize so those who continue doing it continue speaking continue retweeting keep doing it despite the fact they can't see the other side they are the ones blessed by Allah in a mighty way so when I read that ayah that's a political ayah that's an ayah that says to me that guys I know that it sounds tough at the time and this is why I say to people I know it sounds hard I know it sounds difficult but the political maxim in the Quran is do it and if you're patient Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make those enemies today turn into our warmest allies that's a maxim that you apply today with Palestine it's a maxim that you apply today for example when you're criticizing things that are happening in Saudi Arabia or in Turkey or in Qatar or the like if you embark on this initiative and you see it as beyond the spiritual sense you see the change that we're seeing today because to put it quite frankly why is the telegraph in the UK saying we should ban TikTok why are they talking about shadow banning social media accounts because who shouted first about Palestine it was us who talked first about it? It was us. Who were the first to retweet Mu'taz Azayza and Plastia and Muhammad al -Kurdani? It was We were the ones who initially were retweeting them. Then we carried it. Then the allies came. So we did the da'wah. And we did the good deed. And we said we're doing it because we're Muslims. And Allah made those who are opposed to us into our own allies. So that's just an example. Yeah, I mean, it's gone to the point now where people are saying, oh, you know, uh, Osama bin Laden's, you know, trending Stop. on TikTok. No, no, I'm not, yeah, saying, yeah, I'm yeah. not saying I agree with yeah, it, but yeah. it's just funny because you have veterans who are coming, you know, who fought in Desert Storm. Now they've complete 180 and they have a huge following on social media speaking against Zionism, saying I was a fool to have fallen for these lies. Um, and again, social media, even though they try their best to ban these hashtags and, and crack down on things, just because we've been sharing it so much and retweeting it so much, it just keeps going up and up and up. Um, but, but notice even on that point, so that's, that's an outcome that if you'd asked me four weeks ago we could achieve, I would have told you I really don't know. When people, sometimes people ask me, they say to me, Sammy, what should I be doing in order to achieve an outcome? And I always tell them, I don't know what the outcome is. All I know is when you move, the outcome starts to show itself. No. And the reason being is that you are asking about the Quran, for example, and, and I'll be honest with you, another political example is Musa alayhi salam in front of the magicians. You know, he's seen all the signs and he's talked to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the like. But still, Allah says in Surah Taha, فَأُوْجَسَفِي نَفْسِي خِيفَةً Musa. He stands in front of them. Allah has told him that he's with him and showed them the signs and said that I will support you. But all Musa alayhi salam sees in front of him is while he has a promise from Allah, he sees a crowd that is antagonistic to him, that is booing him, that is insulting him. He sees magic magicians who are jeering him. He sees a pharaoh that could kill him at any time. Everything around him suggests that he's by himself and he's isolated. And every object objective assessment of that situation says that he's a lunatic for standing in front of the magicians and throwing it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then reminds him, reminds him yeah. and says, you know, uh, <clears throat> reminding him. So Musa needs another reassurance and not only that, he needs to be reminded what he has to do. You know, throw it in your right hand, it will sort everybody out. SubhanAllah. The, the, all he did was, all he had to do was throw it. That's Allah, it. And Allah took his care of the rest. Exactly. Allah yeah. told him, take the action. Don't take do nothing. Action, yes. Take the action. Throw it. Leave the rest to me. Musa could, salam, could not see the outcome. This is the point I want to make when you're asking, yeah. why does the Quran give you a political framework? Nobody knows what the outcome is. People plan. Even diplomats, they plan. When we were doing this scenario, when I gave you the dynamics, we, I gave the example, we're sitting on the table and planning. If Iran does this, what are our options? Do we trust the Saudi army? Do we, we're planning, we're planning, we're planning, but we're not certain of the outcome. When bin Salman is going to try to normalize ties with Israel, he's not certain of the outcome. He's doing it because he's determined this is the best solution in light of the dynamics that he's considering, considering at the time. The same way that we do. What the Quran tells you is, is it's not wrong to not know the outcome. If you don't know the outcome, that's fine. But move and do something about it and Allah will handle that outcome. And I think that even when you look at the Palestine-Israel, the reality is that Netanyahu and Blinken in the beginning, their outcome was we'll ethnically cleanse Gaza and we will demolish the Palestinians and we'll bring the Palestinian Authority to rule over Gaza and get rid of Hamas. But they couldn't achieve that outcome. Why? Which shows they don't have all the... Think about today. That we're talking about the hostage exchange and the ceasefire. Do you think Netanyahu, this was his ideal scenario? Uh, Five days ago, they first off, they wanted to level Gaza. Uh, any talk of ceasefire, any talk of hostage exchange was completely out the window. They were bombing ind indiscriminately and then going in and taking the photo ops later. Look what Hamas did. They burned our hostages. So the fact that there's a ceasefire now shows that there's a complete 180. 
One in the situation. And the question gets posed there as a political analyst. Why? What forced that 180? Firstly, it shows that they had an outcome in mind that they're unable to achieve. Yes. So Alhamdulillah, all power belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That should encourage everybody who is saying we can't see the outcome, so it's no point. They couldn't see the outcome, so it shows you should mobilize as well. The second point is, it wasn't because of the Muslim governments. It wasn't because of bin Salman or bin Zayd or Erdogan. Or any, it was because of you, because of public opinion. Now, as a political analyst, when I see that, I get excited. I get my whiteboard out. I'm like, okay, wow. So public opinion, I knew it would make a difference. But did I think it would make the difference in achieving what it's achieved so far? Who would have thought Elon Musk Who? buying Twitter was the number one catalyst of freeing Palestine? I was against Elon Musk buying Twitter. And now I think, oh, good on him. If it was the previous administration, then the shadow bans would have been in yep. from immediately. You don't yep. know where Allah's hikmah is. Basim Yusuf, who contributed to the coup in Egypt, somebody who I, I really like, I, I was really upset at his role in Egypt coup. Egypt coup. Allah used him as a vehicle. He gave the best interview with Piers Morgan. Yeah. He's the one who managed to shift the Lord. Allah chooses the vehicles. that, And that's why I think sometimes that when people focus on the outcome too much, they forget that politics is not about outcomes. Politics is the science of human relations and also the science of opportunities and creating those opportunities. It's like I know here in the US, you know, you have, uh, I, I think it's sacrilege and blasphemous, but you call it football. You know, your American football, even though they don't, I, I watched an American football game for the first time in my hotel room a few days ago, and you don't use the feet at all. You know, like it's, it's a disgrace you call it football. But anyway, <laughs> in American football, if you notice the aim of the game, you're winning yards. You know, you get ready and you try to win as many yards as possible. <coughs> then you start again. I think that a lot of it is like this because the more yards you win, the more opportunities you have to get to the outcome that you're trying to. And you think about where's the different opportunity? Should we go to the right? Should we go to the left? Yes. Should we go yes. deeper a bit? And all those tactics to take those opportunities. And I think the Quran tells you the same as well. Because the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he says, Woman arad al wa sa'alaha sa'yahu mu'minun fa'ula'ika kana sa'yahu mashkura. Yes. The reason this ayah drove me to insanity for about six months is because why doesn't Allah say the result is rewarded? Why does Allah say that those who strive and believe in Allah the, uh, the Allah rewards the striving. Why didn't Allah say he reward the result? So is there a scenario where I go my whole life trying to achieve something and I'll never achieve it? Why is that fair? And then I read this as a teenager and you think, <coughs> you think, subhanAllah, then you start memorizing Surah Nuh and you see Nuh alayhi salam how he says to Allah, Rabbi inni da'atu qawmi layla wa nahara wa lam yizidhim du'ai illa firara wa anni kullama da'atuhum li takhfira lahum ja'alu asabi'ahum fi adhanihim wa stakhshaw thiyabahum wa asarru wa stakbur istikbara you see Nuh, like, you know, when I read it, I don't know if it's the Jews to say it, but you can feel his pain, how he's lamenting it. Allah, I'm trying. I told them day and night calling them. And every time I call them, they run away from me. Yeah. And when I say to them, they put their fingers in their ears and they humiliate me by covering their face. Like Nuh, get away from us. For 900 years, think about it. 900 years, Allah refuses to give him any power to force his people to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in other words, when you read that, that's how you reconcile the striving. And yeah. that Allah, in reality, is not asking you for an outcome. Allah already is in charge of the outcome and he's decided it. The honor Allah is giving you is, do you want to be a vehicle to achieve that outcome? Do you want to position yourself as a vehicle to achieve that outcome? And so when you start bringing, bringing that back into politics, you start realizing that politics is not about achieving outcomes per se, as much as it's about altering the dynamics of the powers to create new opportunities. For example, Erdogan going to the Russians when the Americans pressed him. It wasn't that he liked the Russians or he wanted an alliance. He realized to push back against the Americans, I need to force a change in the power balance. So he went to the Russians. I understood it. You know, even though I decide what the Russians are doing in Syria or the like, it gave him breathing space in order to be able to assert himself in Muslim countries such as Libya or Central Asia or these other places. I can appreciate that. I don't know if it's right or wrong, but I understand why he's doing it. But I also think the Quran in this context gives you an example in that at the end of the day, even when you're analyzing politics or you're mobilizing towards politics, you don't need to see the outcome. What you need to do is be a player where the other players have to adapt and that creates opportunities in and of itself. And I think life is much more exciting when you come to that conclusion. So don't automatically, when you're going through a political scenario or if you're trying to figure out which way the movement should go, don't just be result necessarily result-oriented. We have to achieve this deal or this partnership to gain this goal. Maybe you are, like you said, trying to change the, the dynamic. Is that, am I understanding that right? H here's an example for America. So sure, I, please. So I, so I can, can you frame it with an LGBTQ? Because that's like a big... Let, 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 let's start with the US with regards to Biden and Gaza and Israel and then and, uh, Gaza and Palestine. And then we'll, we'll, we'll talk about LGBT afterwards. Okay. 
So I came here to the US and one of the reasons that I agreed to the LA invitation, even though I thought, what's the point in flying 13 and a half hours all the way to Akhir dunya the ends of the world where, <laughs> where everything is far away, where you have freeways and there's nothing free about the freeway because there's always traffic and everything is one hour away or one hour, 15 minutes away. Like, and I thought, okay, it's, it's a bit <laughs> far out on the other side, but it is what it is. One of the reasons that I was very fascinated in being here in America, and it's only my second time here, first time on the West Coast, is I wanted to see what is the Muslim political thinking now that Allah has given them a power in which they are potentially the deciding vote in four of the swing states that Biden is behind Trump in. Correct. And I found that many Muslims are saying it's either Biden or it's either Trump. But I was confused in that. Do you remember when Biden, there was the talk about whether he'd run for a second term? Yes. Yeah. Do you remember how top Democrats refused to say whether he would run for a second term? Yeah. And do you remember how some of his close aides were suggesting he would not run for a second term? Yes. And then Biden blindsided them by coming out of a helicopter or coming off a plane. And he said, I am running for a second term. And people said that he did it because there was growing voices in the Democrats that he shouldn't run. And he was cutting them off quickly by announcing he would run for a second term. So there would be no revolt and no rebellion, which suggests that there is a strand in the Democrats that is significant enough that believes that Biden shouldn't run for a second term and perhaps they might still hold those opinions. Now, Gavin Newsom here locally, for, he's, for, yeah. For example, okay, yeah. so, so let's, let's, let's go with it politically, right? So you have already a scenario in which there are some Democrats who don't want Biden to run for a second term, mm -hmm. right? And you also have the Democrats, Kamala Harris has come out with a video announcing a new counter Islamophobia initiative, not because she suddenly woke up and said, wallahi, she doesn't say wallahi, but she, not because she suddenly <laughs> woke up and said, mesakin, like these poor Palestinians, it's because the Democrats, the only conclusion, they sat on a table and they said, we're behind in four swing states. Muslims might be the deciding vote. They're very angry with us. How can we appease them? So the, one of the tactics is we're willing to counter Islamophobia. And the other tactic is an email that the Democrats sent out six days ago from this recording in which they said, Trump wants to bring the Muslim ban. We're against the Muslim ban. That shows to me that Democrats are aware that the weak point that they have in their, in their armor is the Muslim vote, right? If I balance that you were saying, how do you bring these events and bring them all together, right? So I have a Democrats who are willingly, who don't want Biden to run second term. And I have the Democrats now chasing the Muslim vote. So I know that Muslims have power. The Democrats have recognized it. And I also know there's a potential scenario, 5% scenario where Democrats, if they have the chance, they will remove Biden and put another candidate instead because they don't want him to run for a second term. How can I force this potential scenario then? What is preventing the Democrats from changing Biden? It is because they believe that there is a chance that they can keep Biden and the Muslims will still vote which means to change that perception, I need to try to convince the Muslims to mobilize in a way where the Democrats come to the conclusion that 100% we're going to lose those swing states. And if they come to the conclusion that 100% we're going to lose those swing states, they're not going to sit there waiting to lose. They're going to take action. What action could they viably take? They could viably remove Biden and viably put another candidate in place. And if they put the other candidate in place, all of the journalists will say that the Muslim minority, which had technically had no power before, brought down a sitting US president and forced a change in the candidate. I think this is a very viable plan that the Muslims could go to. And I'm already seeing campaigns, hashtag no to genocide Joe. But the Muslims responded to me, some of them and said, but what if the other representative is worse? And here is where we look about the idea. What is it that you're focused on? They're focused on the outcome in that I want the other person to be perfect. I'm saying that the victory is not in what the other person does. The victory is in you demonstrating that the Muslims have the power to punish. That the Muslim mm. is a political group that if you upset them, they can punish you politically. That power, think about the Zionist lobby. The Zionist lobby is not powerful because their representatives are perfect. The Zionist lobby is powerful because if that representatives goes left or right, they have the power to bring them down. You want to show and prove that you have that equal power. So even if the candidate ends up being worse than Biden, that's not the victory. The victory is you demonstrated that you have the power in order to bring change and in order to punish that them. That you force their hand. That you force their hand. And yes. I think as a political analyst, it would be very exciting to see if Muslims would be able to mobilize in this regard. In the UK, for example. Okay. UK, for example, some of the Muslims are mobilizing and we're talking about this idea. And Muhammad Jalal is also pursuing it as well. The idea that... The, there are, he says there are 80 constituencies. I think maybe there might be about 40 or 50 constituencies out of 300 and something parliamentarians where the Muslims have the deciding vote, where you could topple that sitting MP and you could bring about independence. In the beginning, many Muslims were like, oh, the system is always rigged. There's no point. The usual arguments, let's sit at home. I know this sounds controversial. I'm not saying that they are these people. I'm simply saying that when they say it, this comes to my mind. I repeat. I'm not saying that those who say it are these people. I'm saying that when they say it, this is the air that comes to my mind. 
which is when Bani Israel told Musa, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا إنها هنا قاعدون. We are saying, go you and your Lord and fight because there's no way we'll be able to defeat those people. And so they said that and Allah forbade it for them for 40 years. Anyway, Andrew Ma, the top political commentator in the United Kingdom last week did a video for the New Statesman in which he said, I am hearing rumors that imams across the country are telling Muslims to now go and vote for independent MPs to split the Labour Party vote. And that there are at least 40 or 30 constituencies where this is possible. And while some, many, some people are saying that this is all hype, in a tight election between the Conservatives and the Labour Party, in the tight election, 30 seats decides between the winners and decides who the winner is going to be. In other words, it gives you kingmaker status. So the point here being is that even now when you look at the US, and this is what I was trying to tell people while I'm here, Allah has given you a unique position whereby you are able to exert power disproportionately in an objective way as a result of the way the system is designed. Are you ready to use it? Are you willing to mobilize? Have you identified it? Mm. Have you calculated the dynamics in order to push forward? Are you able to come to, and this is what I mean by political analysis in that you're analyzing possibilities. A is doing this, B is doing this, C is doing this, D is doing this. Why are they doing? They're all reacting to each other. These are the potential scenarios that might potentially unfold. And I think that it's an exciting time in that I think that this is unprecedented, the level of power that the Muslim communities have in both the UK and the US. What I am concerned about is that the Ummah has a self-defeatist mentality that is ingrained in their subconscious that even <laughs> when this opportunity is now presented to them, they're not sure that if it should be taken or not. And those who are telling them to take it, they are looking at them and saying, I'm still not convinced that you will be able to take it. And they are talking about side issues as to whether that representative will be good or not. And as I said, the point is not about the representatives. The point is showing that the Muslims, you cannot trample on their vote. If you upset them, they punish you. And that's the point that I think, that, that's an example in, in the American example. So even if they bring someone in that doesn't work out for us, then it's like, well, you're on your way out the next time around. Exactly. And, and, and also, That's the power to punish. That's the, uh, put yourself in the position yeah. of the politician. You know, put yourself in the position of the politician where he knows or she knows that they almost lost the election because of the Muslim vote and they had to change Biden for another candidate in order to secure the Muslim vote for the Democrats. Like they're barely scraping by. They're barely scraping by. When they think about the consideration for the next elections, what's the calculation? The calculation is... Instead of visiting 10 mosques, I should visit every mosque in the district just to be safe. Yeah. I need to learn more about what Muslims want. I need to learn more about what they're thinking. I need to sit down with them more. Some people will say, yeah, but how does that translate? But dude, they're not coming to you right now at the moment because they think you have no choice. They're not taking you seriously because they think you have no choice. I don't know if you were following the last election, but we had some prominent political activists that were heavily involved, uh, like Linda Sarsour. She was heavily involved and then... Um, I think at the drop of a hat, they dropped her mm. uh, due to her comments on Palestine. They completely shunned her from the movement the, and then they had, like, had to apologize and bring her back. But um, it but, just showed how but take for example, they didn't care. But one, <coughs> one, of, one of the things that I think that the, the greatest injustice that the Ummah inflicts on itself is that the Ummah appreciates how far it's actually come over the past 90 years. I had friends who, and bear in mind, sometimes you have the critics. So some people will say, Sammy, you always have an optimistic take on the Ummah. No. And so sometimes they want to, and, and it's because of how I, I've, I've interpreted the Quran at least, and I hope it's the right way of interpreting it. Sure. But the point is that, so, so, so I remember a friend of mine when Rashida Tlaib got censored for her comments on Palestine. Yeah. yeah. And a friend of mine sent me the news and he said, look, you keep talking about social media. Ha, look, they censored Rashida Tlaib. So I opened my phone and I sat there looking at it. And he's next to me and he's saying to me, go on, say something. Where's your eloquence now? Where's your tongue gone now? And I looked and I looked and I was like, 192. He said, what 192? I said, 192, that's mad. He goes, yeah, it's 252 people. They voted, Congress people, they vote. I said, yeah, but 192 didn't. When have you ever seen 192 Congress people defy Israel? When have you ever seen 192 Congress people refuse to toe the Israeli line? That's unprecedented. The Muslim community hasn't even mobilized yet. They haven't even tried to deploy their power and already Israel is losing their grip on many of those Congress people. Because of like social media. Because of social media. You saw the, yeah. what was his name? He's running for Senate and APAC offered him 20 million. I, I forgot his name. Yeah, and, he's and, on Twitter, he made and, it public. And he came out and he said, yes, they offered me 20 million to run against Rashida Tlaib. So Rashida Tlaib is heavily criticized by many in the Muslim community. So is Ilhan Omar. And I keep getting asked, Sami, what's your opinion of Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar? And my opinion is bluntly this. For all of the mistakes that they make, the reason why I am struggling with the opinion of them is because when I see right-wing politicians frothing at the mouth 
when they see Ilhan, or frothing at the mouth when Rashida raises her voice for Palestine, I always argue, I say, okay, they may be imperfect representatives, but the other side is clearly seeing an impact that they're concerned about. They're seeing a trajectory that they're concerned about. But this goes back to how you were talking about the Quran and Sunnah framework. Okay, the other side is frothing at the mouth. The other side is very upset to see them. But at the same time, they are making She had a type through us under the bus, let's put it bluntly, in Michigan. To, when they were, Muslims went to schools to advocate against trans LGBT stuff in the books. She's the, for one of yeah. the big ones who said, Muslims, or, these are extremists, need to shut up type of thing. Ilhan, Ilhan voted for the, the Israeli funding the last time around. No, and I'm just yeah. saying, you, you, there's like a, a, a sympathy towards them, but at the same time, you know, if we're supporting them and they're supporting all this fahisha, right? Then wouldn't that, at the end of the day, not work out from like a Sunnah framework, right? So Let's take a step back. Let's take a step let's back. Let's take a step back. Okay. I'm if, trying to be a political analyst. No, no, let's take a step back. As a political analyst, 100%. This is exactly what we're going to do. Okay. Step back. You're asking as a political analyst to analyze the phenomenon of Ilhan Omar Rashid at life. If I was to ask you the extent to which the Muslim community engages with the political system, you would say it's limited. If I was to ask you the levels of engagement that Muslim, ordinary Muslims have with the system, you'd say it's limited. For a number of reasons, we don't need to go into them. So your limited engagement your deformed state of engagement is producing representatives that you believe to be, in terms of values and the like, deformed. The level of your effort and striving is producing a certain result. Mm. You are getting exactly what you are investing into your efforts. The level of your efforts is producing a certain level and caliber of representatives. No. The conclusion is not, oh, this is what the system produces. The conclusion should be, if I put a bit more effort in terms of the community and how it mobilizes, it, the, it lo the logic follows that you will get a better caliber of represented, which is why I made the point that the reason I struggle with the idea of what conclusion you should make about them is I can see that the right wing is frothing, not at Ilhan Omar per se, and this is why I said earlier, frothing at the trajectory. If today it's Ilhan Omar, tomorrow it is somebody who doesn't do the things that made that Ilhan Omar did that made everybody upset. Mm. If 15 years ago there weren't even Muslims who were dressed in a way that suggested that they were Muslim, if today, 15 years ago there weren't, and today there are, the trajectory suggests that we're going towards representatives of a higher caliber, more closely aligned with the values of the Muslim community, and that the Muslim community is getting stronger. So there are two conclusions people reach. One conclusion says that because of Ilhan al Rashida, there is no point, but the reason I don't like that conclusion is because it assumes that your maximum effort produced that, whereas I argue that your minimal effort produced that. The correct conclusion is that if minimal effort produces representatives we don't like, imagine what maximum effort would produce in terms of the caliber or the like. You were looking at values such as LGBT or the conservative values or the like. But let's be honest, there is a conservative backlash to a lot of those values. I know people in the Muslim community, they were talking about right-wing allies, left-wing allies or the like, but I think the reality is that, that it's, it's a debate that doesn't really have any standing because the Muslim is not reacting to the conservatives because they are conservatives. They are aligning with an issue and when they look at the issue, they are looking who is standing with the issue and that's how they are forming their alliances. It's like Ali bin Abi Talib anhu, where he said that you don't judge truth based on who said it. You judge people based on whether they say the truth. The point here being is we look at the idea, the cause. We have certain values that we uphold. As we pursue those values, we look at who is standing around those values. And on that particular issue, we form our alliances. On other issues where they are not standing with those values, where we don't find them there, we don't stand with them. I don't understand why it has to be one or the other, particularly when you... Well, it seems like here, when we stand by somebody, it's an all for nothing. All or nothing. We just go all the way. And you I know, think... That's, uh, and, and I think... A lot of that has to do with the Muslim mentality. I'll give an example, a, a social example. As a Muslim community is when we're brought up uh, in the UK, if ethnic parents, if ethnic, uh, like, you know, I'm born and raised in London. But if I went to my dad and I said to my dad for university, I want to take a gap year because I want to go backpacking in the Himalayas. He'd tell me, yeah, jahil, ya mutakhallif, you backwards. I work hard and I came or whatever to ensure that you can go do backpacking in the Himalayas, yeah. You know, like you have no shame. <laughs> really, honestly. Yeah. And then I'd look at, for example, like my white friends in the football team, casual. They, they went to do, I don't know, work in a school in Ghana and then they for a gap year and then they went and did volunteering. <laughs> they were waiters in Athens, in Greece. And then they came to university and they were very calm. They were, the point here being is that 
as a as, the point here being is as a community and and sometimes i say this experience and many people have the same as a community we're very it's do or die you know it's everything or nothing it's we're under heavy pressure it's we have to take the opportunities now it's you know as if there's a threat that is looming over us and we have to keep mobile and keep moving and i think that sometimes that is that mentality is reflected in the way that we judge our representatives in that they must be perfect or not and and what changed my mind about it and you know it's not that I'm stretching the air yet, but I'm telling people that this is my current observations and I'm aware that all wisdom and knowledge belongs to Allah and Allah is the one who gives it to whom he wills. So I'm aware that this is my conclusion as it stands. When Allah in Surah Ghafir says, وَقِهِمُ السَّيِّئَاتِ وَمَنْ تَقِ السَّيِّئَاتِ يَوْمَ إِذٍ فَقَدْ رَحِمْتَ وَذَلِكَ هُوَ الْفَوْزُ الْعَظِيمِ when Allah says, and pardon them their sins, this is the angels who are holding the thrones of Allah, and they are making istighfar for those who believe and asking Allah to forgive them and their parents and their children and the like. And they say, and Allah, wipe out their sins. It's not just istighfar, it's wipe it out completely so that they're never held to account for it. And the one whom, whose sins you wipe out, you've shown mercy. And this is the greatest of victories. The point I'm making here is, look who the characteristics of the people who Allah has given the greatest victory. He didn't say it's the perfect one who does everything perfectly and does. He didn't say it's the one who I I, I don't know who who prays all the salat and all the sunnah with it and tahajjud the like. Allah said that those who've committed their sins and those who've repented for their sins. Allah, when you wipe that, that's the greatest of victory. Suggesting that those who buckle, who make mistakes, who then apologize for their mistakes, who try to rectify it, who take and then buckle again, and then they make a mistake, they make to, and then they buckle again, and then they try again. The idea of buckling, make a mistake, and reorganizing, and re-strategizing, and moving again is not wrong in Islam. In fact, Allah is telling you that there's no problem with it. That's fine. It's okay to make the mistakes. Allah is ghafur rahim and forgives for what he wills. It's not the sense you should take it lightly. The point is Allah says you are not condemned by the mistake that you make forever no. that is good to mobilize and to keep and i think that with the representatives and and the like the reality is that i think that politics is hard you know i always say i have, a, I have an example here that um in uh, soccer as you guys call it and, and i played the uh, soccer at university uh, and uh, I, rem I remember because <laughs> <laughs> I think he says it. He says it with an American accent. Kind of <laughs> what position did you play? Uh, midfield and center midfield. Intelligent man. Oh, okay. So one thing that my coach used to say. We is, all played soccer, by the way. Yeah, alhamdulillah, very alhamdulillah. good. So uh, it's much better than American football. But anyway, <laughs> so 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 one thing that you notice is that we, you know, when 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 you get picked ahead of somebody and the other person is grumbling on the bench. Oh, I so oh look at that pass. Oh, what is that? And the coach used to say that everybody's a genius on the bench. Yeah. When you're sitting and you're not involved in the play, it's easy to see what you should and should have done. Yeah. When you're in it, and you know, you've played football before. Finding the right pass is not easy, you know, over 90 minutes, you know? Knowing when to shoot, when to pass, when to lay off the ball, when to dribble, when you've got two defenders bearing down on you or two midfielders shutting up the space. It's not easy. And I think that sometimes, and I know it sounds bad, and, and, and this is just a suggestion for people to consider, I do think that when Allah talks about the Sahaba and says, you know, they are ashidda'u ala al-kuffari ruhama'u baynahum, that they are tough on the disbelievers and merciful between themselves. I sometimes think and then in some situations that this ummah is tough on the believers and soft on the, on, 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 on. they make more excuses for Andrew Tate <coughs> than they do for, you know, for example, somebody who's really been grounded in the community. I'm going to push back a Fadal. little bit because while I do agree Right, that maybe sometimes we can be a little bit hard on ourselves and that maybe we should think of it as an iterative process. Maybe the next one will be better. The trend seems to be that when someone gets voted in or someone becomes a representative of the community, then it becomes the maxim that the entire community has to rally around this person regardless of whatever mistakes they make or will make and they are the best and we have to support them every single election. There doesn't seem to be any sort of that recalibration process is non-existent. Like Ilhan Omar, there was another person that was trying to run against her who was, uh, she was like a conservative hijabi who served in the military who hates LGBTQ. No one ever heard of her. But she, you know, she's, she's also, uh, of, 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 uh, she's also African-American. So, but there was no Muslim support for her because she was Republican rather than being a Democrat. So, I think for us here, I think we, we have to kind of, we don't have to be so married to, the, to that person every single time they win. 
I, I think we get really scared. Oh, this person won this. But you know what? I think to Sammy's point, I think he made a very good point in that the iterative process comes from that striving. And I don't think our community does any striving when it comes to, I, I'll be honest. I think you made a very good point that really like, recalibrated the way I thought about, you know, like Islam and politics and like action and activism. You made the point that the, a lot, most of the Sahaba did not die in Medina because they understood from the Prophet ﷺ, someone who'd lived in Mecca, Medina and died there, that our role is not here. It's to pray, qiyam, siyam, all that good stuff, but to go out and spread ourselves and die in Al-Quds and die in China and die in India and die in Egypt and die wherever else, far, far away from the best place to die, Medina al-Munawwara. Mm. So I think uh, to Sammy's point that yes, these politicians are there, but I think they're continuously there because I didn't get more active in politics, to be honest, when she was there. But let's and flip get it. more and yeah. more and more. Like, I don't think the community is getting more involved like, necessarily. No, we have a structure like content, like, in America that supports these politicians. We I have organizations that prop them up, that send out flyers to donate for them. They exist. And they're not, I don't think they're interested in supporting another candidate. But let me flip what you said. So, Tfadda. so you're talking about the situation as it is today. And, and let's assume that I accept what you said is okay. the status quo it is, as it is today. I think that if you look at it over the past 10, 20 years, you're perfectly right. But I think that more than 20 years ago, we didn't have these sorts of representatives and we also didn't have this kind of mobilization or even this kind of position or status in the system. The point here being is that we are talking about a situation that is relatively recent compared to the past 90 years of the development of rights, of the role of the Muslims, of the power that the Muslims have or the like. 1968, you guys were still talking about civil rights for black people and I mean, not you, Staff Ali, but, but America itself. Yeah, we yeah. weren't born. <laughs> yeah, you weren't born. <laughs> 1968, you know, they still about civil rights for the Americans. In the 1980s, our elders, they came to London, for example, or to the UK. No. There were no mosques. They did the proliferation of mosques. In the 1990s, they began to engage with the system. They started tentatively putting in representatives in the councils or the like. In the 2000s, we started getting MPs. You know, as in, it's the next level. We started getting MPs in parliament, some Muslim representatives. We had about five, six or the like. In the 2010s, we had a bit more. We're talking about now mayor of London, Sadiq Khan comes in. And the, the, the point here being is that even when Sadiq Khan were talking about the issue of the LGBT, the reality is that it feels like it's always been the case. But what I'm arguing is that it hasn't always been the case. And rather, the problems that we're talking about feel like they've always been there. But I'm arguing they are new problems that have been brought about as a result of the advances that the community has made in its engagement with the system. Once upon a time, we were struggling to get representatives into the system. Now that we've got representatives into the system, we're faced with a new problem. The problem before is we couldn't get into the system. The problem, uh, once we resolve that problem, we got our representatives and now we have a new problem in that they don't really align with much of the values of the Muslim community and they're expecting us to rally around them every single time. The point that I'm making here is that your framing suggests this has always been the case. My framing is suggesting that this is a recent phenomenon in which the initial strategy the community had was to always rally behind them. And now you're analyzing that and saying, guys, in this recent phenomenon, that has come about as a result of the gains that the community has made over the past few decades, as a result of us being in a position that our forefathers weren't in and yeah. that they worked to get us here, we're now presented with a new problem because the previous problems have been resolved in terms of our message and the communities. We'd have the luxury now of not having to focus on those issues. We now have a new issue, which is the representatives that we're putting forward don't represent us. This is what I mean in that it's not an optimistic take but rather the, the framing of the debate is important because if you frame it as a situation, and, and, and I promise I'll finish here, if you frame it as a situation that's always been there, it creates hopelessness and despair in the discussion about how to move forward. But if you frame it as a recent phenomenon in which we've taken a decision mm. and that decision was wrong, you frame it as, okay, it's recent, we tried this, that didn't work, now let's try that. The, 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 the approach with which you address the problem, this is politics in its very essence. Yes. The politics and the montalaq, the basis on which you approach the problem, the, the, the two approaches produce very different opportunities and potential solutions. And I think if you focus on the framing, on, on not your framing, because I know you were just presenting it the way some people talk here, I think that produces negative results. This potentially produces positive results. I 100% agree with you. And if you do want to think of it as a recent phenomenon, then yeah, maybe you can date it to say post 9 11, Muslim, mm -hmm. Muslims engaging in politics where it's lowest hanging fruit, grab whatever you can, scramble to get a seat at the table, no matter because the cost. It was like that. Exactly. And then maybe within the past, like you said, now, now 
the Democrats are freaking out. Kamala Harris comes out last second. No one even sees her anymore. And all of a sudden she's talking about, <coughs> you know, Islamophobia to the point where, uh, sorry. Oh, there goes. She's controlling Biden with his Neuralink. And uh, yeah. Else is going on to the point where uh, the Ben Shapiro is freaking out saying, that, you know, Hamas, Hamas is mm. destroying the Israel. You know, they're, they're killing babies and uh, the White House is talking about Islamophobia. So there is that power shift. That dynamic is happening. So maybe this is the tipping point for Muslims where we can have a rethinking, right? A recalibration of maybe we have way more power than we think, right? Um, and it's not just with the vote. It's if you talk about societal change, which communities seem to be the most stable, right? America's, America's thinking about its birth rate. Just because it's not being talked about on, on the news, it's not a forefront news, doesn't mean it's not an issue. So which, which communities have the best families? Which communities have the most uh, uh, developed communities, safe communities? It all happens to be the Muslim communities. So there's a lot of social, social uh, leverage that we can excise um, in continuing to recalibrate. So I, I, I did like your point about how you said, you know, don't think of it as the status quo always there and forever but think of it as maybe a recent phenomena, so then you can reframe your thinking but, into... But, but, but to put this into context, because yeah. some, sometimes people people always ask the question, Sammy, where do you get this information? Where do you get this thinking from? All the, like? the reality is it comes from mistakes. It doesn't come from reading. So this view that I have, it didn't emerge because I read it in a book. It emerged because I had a conversation with a journalist once of a French paper mm -hmm. in Paris. And we were talking, we were talking about France, where it's headed. And he said to me that, Sammy, you know, we have a crisis here in France. I said, what? Because I don't see no crime. Macron is racist. He's cracking down on Muslims. He's whatever. He's, you know, Muslims and the mosques are being whatever. And he said to me, no, we have a problem. The heroes of the new French generation are the Muslim Paul Pogba, Muslim N'Golo Kante, Muslim Karim Benzema, Muslim Zinedine Zidane. The new French generation will no longer know what it means to be French. It is transforming what the French identity is and how the French perceive what it means to be French. And this was coming at a time in which people were, you know, debating the religiosity of some of these figures. You know, Karim Benzema might have got involved in some things, but, you know, he, he, he said he went to Jeddah because he wants to be close to Mecca or the like, you know. And, but, but the point is that when you look at the way that they're viewing the trajectory that the Muslim community is taking, this is what I meant in that the Ummah needs to appreciate where it came from. It needs to appreciate what's been achieved over the past 90 years. You can see that the language and debate that's taking place in France is one in which they're concerned that while the Muslims don't have the power that you want them to have, they're concerned that the Muslims are gaining power and that more French people are entering Islam and they don't know how to handle that phenomenon. And the reason why I change a lot of my opinion in terms of whether the Ummah is bleak or not is because when I went to Bosnia, for example, and I see that under communism and under Yugoslavia, the way they tried to smash the Muslims, smash the mosques or the like, and then there was attempted genocide by the Serbs, and still Islam is thriving more than ever and preserved. The point is they wanted to eliminate Islam, but they couldn't. When you go to the Bosnians and you see how they celebrate that no matter what, they still... I, I give an example like for, for people to reconsider. So there is uh, one of the most uh, scenic train journeys you can take in Europe is from Mostar to Sarajevo in Bosnia. So I wanted to try the train journey because my wife and I, we run this tour company and I thought sometimes we'll do in the minibus from Sarajevo to Mostar because it's nice, but we'll take the train back in case they're a bit tired. It makes it easier. So let's test it out. So while we're on the train, there's a woman sitting next to me. She must have been about 60 or 65. She's wearing tight trousers, a tight top. She's done her hair up and everything. And she's sitting next to her husband. And there's an Australian guy who's heard that we speak English and we're conversing. So he's asking me, oh, do you come to Bosnia often? I say, I come to Bosnia often because, you know, like I, I, I love the history here and I love Izzet Begovic and they make me feel like the Ummah is thriving. And, and I said, you know, and what the Serbs did. And, and she turns around to me and bear in mind, she doesn't dress in a way that suggests that she's Muslim. She turns around and she said, they hate us because we believe in Allah and we are Muslims. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I looked at her and my jaw just dropped because you're looking, you're thinking, Subhan and you know, that her eyes... It, she believed it wholeheartedly. Do you know what I mean? Like for all of the criticisms that the community might make over the way she dressed or the like or whatnot, she said it, you know, in a way that was so defined, you got chills in your body. You were like, this is certain. 
the point here being is they had the aim of removing Islam, but this ummah is in different areas, they're all fighting their own battles, etc. So that's what I mean in that it's about how you view the ummah. The way I view the American Muslim community is that 10 years ago or 20 years ago, you were in a very different place completely. Today, you're in a much more advanced place. Yes, it's not ideal. Yes, it's not where you would want to be at this moment in time or where you would like to be, sorry. But the point here being is that today you're talking about very different problems from those you were talking about before. And what I fear is that if the framing is that this has always been the status quo, you will always be limited in your solutions. And the maxim we have in Islam is the maxim of Ibn Khaldun, Al-Hal la yadum. A status quo never lasts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always changing the status quo of a people. And that's why I always argue that, we, again, we're going back to the religious framework, the, poli the political religious framework. When Allah says, in Allah la yughayru ma bi qawmin hatta yugayru ma bi anfusihim, we, every time, I, I tell you a true story to, in this context. So I got invited by a university to give a talk about Palestine and Gaza in the second or third week of the, of the outbreak. This is in the UK. In the UK. So, you know, and, and I felt that after the Yaqeen podcast, and you know, people were saying, you know what, khalas, we're, we're making, and I thought, I'm just going to scream from the rooftops, whoever will have me, Ya Ibad Allah, keep going, I'm seeing blink and buckle, please believe you have power. Everywhere I got was like, please believe you have power. So I stood up and there was a sheikh who until then I respected very deeply. Uh, and he was next to me and I was very honored to be next to him when he was speaking as well. So I was like, you know, you know, Ya Ibad Allah, Blinken is buckling and Washington Post said he wants to tamp down on public anger. Oliver Vahali of the EU wants to restrict Twitter. Your social media is making a difference. And you know, if you can't change it with your hand, change it with your tongue, etc. And I finished and I said, you know, and they went, Allahu Akbar, alhamdulillah. And I said, yeah. Then the, the Sheikh stood up and he said, this Ummah wants to fight with forwarding WhatsApps. This Ummah wants to fight with social media and they can't even pray to Raqqa before Fajr. I was like, Sheikh, it's not the time for this Sheikh. <laughs> Sheikh, please. He said, no, and, 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 I, and I said, yeah, 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 Sheikh, like you, you are separating the two, whereas I read the seerah like they've always been joined together. And that's why I read that, inna Allah la yigayru ma bi qawmin hatta yigayru ma bi anfusihim. People read it as a spiritual ayah. Fix your ibadah, fix your salat, fix it, and everything will improve. And while that's true, I think that's a half truth. When Allah says, inna Allah la yigayru ma bi qawmin, it is, you have to take action as well. When you move forward and you take the action, that's when Allah changes the affairs of a people. When you're able to mobilize to in the markets, giving da'wah, going out, to striving to resist the injustice, and that's when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the affairs of a people. One of the things that's quite fascinating is that when Muhammad Asad says in his book, the quote, that it's not Muslims who made Islam great, it's Islam that made the Muslims great. He means that when Islam was the impetus for action, the ummah became great. When Islam made the Muslims go out, as you mentioned earlier, go out into the world and the like, and say we want to act, we're going to go to places where we don't understand the language and learn the language and spread the deen and Islam spread to the four corners of the earth. That's when Allah elevated this particular ummah. And that's why I think that sometimes, even when we're looking at you know, the, the, the ummah experience, yes, you may not be happy with the gains, but imagine how Nuh salam, felt 900 years and his conclusions, Allah destroys his people. Imagine how Hud salam, felt, you know, he's to cause his people and, and Allah destroys them. The outcome doesn't belong to you. What belongs to you is you're facing a certain set, of, every generation is facing a certain set of battles. And Allah has given this ummah a certain set of powers to address those. Will the ummah use those powers to address those battles? You don't have to be the guy at the end who stands up and says, yeah, guys, I did it. Because that glory belongs to Allah. Man kana yuridu jamia. Once you accept and you reconcile these things, that's when instead of looking at the representatives who are deformed in the way that they represent the values of the community, you don't say there's no point. You say, okay, this level of engagement produced that. What might this level of engagement produce? And that's why I think even with Palestine and Gaza now, Allah has given Palestine a special heba, a special status. But the reality is that we're all united. Those who supported Assad's genocide are supporting the Palestinians. Those who supported the sectarian killings in Iraq are supporting Palestine. Those who supported Erdogan are supporting, but those who supported UAE are supporting Palestine. Those it, who support Sisi are supporting support, Palestine. Yeah, who support, yeah. Like, like it, yeah. it, 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 it beggars belief. Sometimes I'm on Twitter and I'm like, how did he go from yesterday supporting Assad's brutal bombing of Idlib or the like, or whatever, and today supporting. Allah has given Palestine something special status. Fine. Subhanallah. The question is now is, we have a set of options in front of us, as we explained earlier with Biden, Trump, and the like. Will the Muslim community use their powers? Will they come together and try to channel that into actually making that change? You know, And I think that sometimes, if you look at it in this perspective, that this is a unique challenge, a unique opportunity, when have you ever, let me ask you a question, when have you ever been the deciding vote in an election? 
When has the Muslim community ever been the deciding vote between the Democrats and between the Republicans? This is maybe the Bush and uh, maybe maybe Bush and maybe Florida. Bush, but even Bush, you're saying maybe. Yeah. Here you are definitely the deciding vote in four swing states. You know, you are this. Some people bring back the Bush. They're like, yeah, we did Bush and Bush went to Iraq. But that's not the point. The point is at that time you used power and you delivered Bush, and now you have the chance to punish. You know, the, the, uh, the President Biden and, and, and Muslims the, flip from that actually. And Muslims, but the point is that you made that mistake and you learn from yeah. it and you move forward. And the, the point is that the Ummah keeps moving forward. I think that one of the, the reasons why I always say people should read the Sira <coughs> as a political book is because look at the Sira, look, look at the life of Prophet Sallam politically. 13 so years he gives dawah to his people and they persecute him, they boycott him. Khadija Anhu dies during the boycott. Abu, Abu Talib dies during the boycott. The Muslims are being beaten up. And for 13 years, Allah refuses to give the Prophet Muhammad Sallam any power over Quraysh, any power to resist them. Hamza Anhu is getting angry. Why? Why are we just tolerating this, you know? And he refuses, Allah refuses to give him any power. Then when he goes to Medina and they're celebrating, a thousand Quraysh come out against 300 Muslims. Already they're under pressure. They win in Badr, but they lose in Uhud. Khalid Walid brings the, brings the forces behind. After they lose Uhud, they're building trenches, they're khandak, it's, it's existential crisis. Ahzab, they come along. You look at the, the polit politics one by one, the reality is that, and I'm not saying it because, because this is what I believe, I'm saying what a political analyst might have said at the time, that Muhammad Sallallahu has been going now for 18, 19 years, and the situation just keeps getting worse. Persecuted in Quraysh, defeated in Uhud, now he's building a trench. The Munafiqun were saying the whole Arabia has gathered against him, and he's talking about the pearls of Persia while digging a trench and praying on the uh, on, on Fath Hill, praying and, and saying, Allah, please rescue us on the line. But the reality is that when you look at the outcomes of that, you look and you think, okay, things are deteriorating. But that's not what the Prophet ﷺ was sent. Prophet ﷺ was sent to strive with the Sahaba until they said to him, Mata Nasrullah. The Sahaba said to the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, we've been with you for so long now. We've gone with you, we've striven with you, we've strived with you, everything. But Mata Nasrullah, like it's, it's getting to a level which is too much. And Allah responded says, Allah inna Nasrullah qareeb. Meaning, that when they said it to the Prophet ﷺ, they couldn't see the outcome. When they were with the Prophet ﷺ, their conclusion of the political dynamics of the time were, we have no idea where this victory is going to come from. But that didn't stop them from mobilizing and moving forward. And Allah truly did give them the victory later when the Prophet ﷺ took Mecca. But even when he took Mecca, what if I throw you a curveball? Even when he took Mecca, Mecca and Medina were cities that the Persians did not consider worth conquering. Neither did the Romans. Cyrus, for those who watch the film, The Message, when the, when the Prophet ﷺ sends the letter to Cyrus, Cyrus receives the letter and says, I don't understand, you Arabs come out of the desert smelling like rats to tell Persia where it should bow its head. Really, that's because the, 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 the magnificence of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was not in the cities that he conquered. The magnificence was in the spirit that said, never give up, never say die, never sit on your couch, always move, always mobilize. If you trip over, get up and keep moving. If you lose an Uhud, get up and keep moving. If they all come against you, dig your trench and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and resist. It doesn't matter how bad the situation is, the Muslim does not stop. The Muslim keeps moving. And Allah is telling you through these examples that you might think the situation is bleak, but if you keep moving, I will give you that victory. And that's what I meant that the Seerah is a political book and that we're talking about the issues that we have at this moment in time. And alhamdulillah, you are identifying the obstacles obstacles that are in front of us at this time. But yeah. when I look at the seerah, I see, okay, they had worse obstacles. We have these obstacles. These obstacles shouldn't put us off. We should be actively, and I'm happy, alhamdulillah, that this is the way the discussion has gone in this podcast, actively considering ways in which we can go over those obstacles in order to win those battles. And it may, may, it may well be Amr and, and, and Munir that by the time we die, probably people will say the previous generation only achieved an advance of this much. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Allah won't reward us based on the result that we achieved in terms of moving forward. He'll reward the fact that despite when it looked like the odds were against us, Amr Munir and Sami got together and said, what powers do we have to advance it? Let's do a podcast to try to inspire other Muslims to mobilize. And Allah will say, even if it doesn't achieve the result that they want to achieve, look my angels, look at my ibadi, how I have given them the powers, look how they are trying to deploy their powers within the means to celebrate and praise me and to advance my deen. I have forgiven their sins, I will admit them into Jannah. And that's why I think it's fascinating, and I finish on this point, which I think is quite fascinating. Every Prophet, before they die, it is said they are offered a choice. 
between staying in the dunya until day of judgment or to go back to Allah. And they all chose to go back to Allah because for them, truly they felt they were travelers in this dunya and that they wanted Jannah and that was the outcome they wanted. The idea being being a traveler is you go through your life, you see injustice, oh, there's injustice there, let me resist it. And you keep walking. Oh, injustice there, to, and you keep walking. And it's like, I'm not getting attached to any of it here. I want to go to Jannah, but to get there, I have to do side quests. I have to, you know, <laughs> really, you Science, know, like an yeah. RPG game to get there. And I think when you come to a conclusion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not made incumbent on you the outcome, but has made incumbent on you the striving, I think you become a much happier Muslim. I think that when you sit around people, you're always planning new initiatives and new mobilization going forward. And let's be brutally honest. And I promise I'll finish on this point. Let, even though that statement I say every single time. Somebody said to me Can now. You, if, you name your, if you start a substack like I asked, please name it that. No, there's a friend of mine who said, so I said, guys, uh, guys, I know like, uh, and I promise I'll finish here. And now people in the crowd have started going, don't promise. Don't promise because you keep breaking it. Don't promise. But the point is that even like, you look at us sitting on this table. And I tell you on my part, if you had told me five weeks ago I'd be in LA sitting with you guys, I would have thought, what, why, what on earth would take me to LA to sit with, with those two brothers? Allah, you guys strove, and I strove, and other brothers strove. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided that though we couldn't see what shape that striving should take, we did what we could, and Allah now has brought your efforts that were going this way, my efforts going. Allah believed and wrote, wrote that I want to join the efforts of these two and see and, and amplify that as well. So the point here being is that even on a short term, we didn't know the outcome, how the efforts would produce, but the outcomes have produced the result in which we've met together. And we ask Allah to make it a blessed like gathering. But, but the point here being is that when you choose to strive, you don't always know the best methodology. You don't always know how it's go the direction is going to go. And that's why I think that the hadith of when you take one step, Allah takes 10. Again, people read it as a spiritual, but I think it's a political hadith. Because what it means is why does Allah take 10 steps? Why does he cover the, 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 the nine? It's because Allah has said, because you've taken one step, I'm going to make sure you don't make eight wrong steps. So as soon as you take that one step, because I love that you've taken the one step, I'm going to make sure you don't take nine wrong steps by covering those nine and shifting your trajectory this way. I thought the trajectory should have been this way. Allah brought me towards Amr and, uh, and, and Munir, for example. I thought the trajectory was this way. Allah took me to Yaqeen, for example. I thought the trajectory was this way, took me to Sky News, for example, or to Mass LA or the like. I'm happy Allah came nine steps because imagine the mistakes I would have made on those eight steps to get the 10 step. It's a political area. Take one step then and the opportunities that you don't see at the moment will start to become clear. Stay at home and do nothing and you will never see the opportunities. It's just like water. Yeah. Uh, once, once it, if it doesn't move, it becomes stale. It becomes gross. It grows diseases. That's in Muhammad Asad's book as well. Yeah, well, uh, well I think, I think oh, one reason why this resonates so much with our generation, especially we're a generation that is the generation of entitlement, of quick fixes, right? Of push it and I get it on my app tomorrow. Amazon now, and I don't want Prime out now, like within hours, right? Do you guys have so, that? Yes, yeah, yeah. In the UK, London, we have it. In a few hours? London, if I have it, no, in a few hours, no. Uh, but but we have up, catch yeah, up. You got to catch well, up. Well, you have a few hours here. I can Amazon order something now. at noon, and it shows up at five. Amazon I, I complain now. if it doesn't come the next day. No, no. <laughs> oh, I can order something at midnight. It's on my doorstep, 4 a.m. Mashallah, America. This, Welcome to America. <laughs> you, know, you know, you know, when I came when I came to New York for the first time. There were two things I wanted to do. The first was I wanted a taxi to come near me and I go, hey, I'm walking over here. <laughs> and, and, and I really wanted to do it badly, you know? And, and, and I saw Trevor Noah had the same thing. I was like, yeah, yeah, like I wanted to do the same. And the second thing was I wanted to have the water wire exchange. So I was on the plane with, with Allah Yath Krub Khair Abu Bakr Shamahi. He was getting married. He lives in North Carolina now. So when we landed, uh, so when I landed, he was already in America at the time. So I met him at the airport in New York. And I said to him, he said to me, what do you want to eat? I said, I want to go bagel shop, like, because they got <laughs> bagel shops here. So I went to the bagel shop. I ordered my egg bagel. So I walked in. I said, hey, guys, how are you? Can I have a bagel, please? And they said, sure. So I took the bagel. And I felt really happy. I said, Habibi, I'm in America. You know, you know, you must, like, and I, uh, guys, I did it. I, I'm in the movie, you know, like, mashallah. Everyone here talks like the movies. And then Abu Bakr, Allah Yathkrub Khair, went. He said, excuse me, can I have a bottle of water, please? And they went, what? Can I have some water? Water. Water. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, Inna lillahi, inna lillahi And then from the other from the other side I went, War, war. <laughs> he wants war. And they went, Oh war, here you go. And he looked at me, I will not say war. I told him, When in Rome. When in Rome, have you? But the, but you know, some alhamdulillah, but the thing is you never know sometimes where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take you or, or where your life some people people always say, 
you know, like like in terms of career choice, you mentioned about political analysts or like if you had told me in uni that I'd I'd be doing the job I do today, I'd have told you I, I don't see it. I don't I don't, I don't see how yeah. I do it. If you had told Munir and I in college <laughs> that would be in front of mics, would be like, what are you talking about? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah honestly, analyze, just things happen. Yeah, but that's the way I like. And, and I think that what 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 is bewildering for me is how you can see that, like you can see it in your daily lives that you plotted or you made a plan and Allah had other plans and yeah. and it happens every single day in your lives. So why do you accept it for your life, but you won't accept it in terms of your strategies that you choose to move forward? The idea being, okay, I don't have the full plan here, but you know, Julius Caesar used to say that a good general always leaves room for mistakes. A good, always, whenever you make a plan, when you move. And, and I think that's why, and I think it's quite fascinating that, and this is where, I'm, where I mean sometimes where I think one of the dilemmas of the ummah is the division between the spiritual and the, and the political. And I think Muhammad Esad epitomizes quite well where he says, uh, when he was Jewish, when he was a Jewish journalist, he said he went to Jerusalem and he goes by a farmer who he describes had a few tooth loose or like, and, and you know, wasn't dressed in the best way, who was praying. So he said that he asked the farmer, he said, why do you do all these actions? What use does your Lord have with these actions? Why don't you be like the Hindus or the Buddhists or the like, where you focus on the spiritual center? And he says, the farmer, without skipping a beat, turns around to him and says to him, my friend, God created body and soul, right? He said, yeah. So how does it make sense to worship with half and leave the other half? And, and that's why I think sometimes, even when I think one of the things with the Ummah is, we read the Quran as a spiritual book, and I get that. I understand that. But, I, but when you read the Seerah, I can't find the Sahabi who argues that his interpretation of Islam is not to act, is to focus solely on you know, ibadah, even though it's important. All the Sahaba, when you see them, there's a wonderful, indivisible merging between the dunya and between what he's trying to achieve spiritually. You know, he does his tahajjud in the night and the next day he's out in the market, you know, during... The reason I argue that Abu Hanifa is the most prominent madhab is because Abu Hanifa, I think, is one of the only imams who lived his life trading as a trader and the like. So his fatawa that ended up coming out, people just found that it resonated more with their daily lives as opposed to, you know, this. I'm not criticizing that particular aspect of it. Yeah. What I'm saying is that how do you read an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, how can you read an ayah that the one who's your enemy today, tomorrow will be a warm ally? You read it in the context of a family member, but you can't seem to interpret it in the context of Palestine and Gaza when those Jewish allies are taking Congress, for example. You know, you, that interpretation seems to go over people's heads. And that's what I mean in that I don't claim that I have the answers. Everything that I've said here is simply my interpretation, and I could be wrong in it. But my interpretation of Islam is the Ummah has never truly been weak, or the Ummah always has power that Allah has given it. But the state of the Ummah is determined by the extent to which the Ummah is prepared to strive. People always pose the question, okay, you're a political analyst, what should a Muslim state look like? I don't know what a Muslim state looks like because I don't think a Muslim state is defined by what it looks like. It's defined by the spirit of its people. Are the people in that Muslim state a people innovating, a people striving? And a good example would be when the Sahaba read, you know, Maraj al Bahraini al Taqiyan, Baynauma Barzakhun la Yabriyan, that uh, the seas, there is a barrier where they don't overlap. They didn't say, MashaAllah, on to the next ayah. They said, I want to know why. Like, where is this barrier? Oh, guys, let's get on the boat and go and go. You know, it inspired them to go out, you know? When, you know, when the, Allah says, Wal jibala awtada, mountains are like pegs. You know, Sahaba didn't read it and say, you know, for example, MashaAllah, on to the next ayah. They said, what does it mean by pegs? And then they discovered that it means because the tectonic plates, when an earthquake happens, they go over each other. The mountains prevent the tectonic plates from completely, you know, making the earth, you know, fall apart. They were people who read the ayah in a way that forced them into action. Even when you look at, for example, you know, um, that ayah, when it comes down, people look at, okay, I should forgive people. But they forget that a lot. It came down in Abu Bakr al-Siddiq when he said that, you know, I'm not going to fund the person who yeah. slandered Aisha. Anha. And so Allah was telling him, no, take the action, go and forgive them. And forgiveness, what does it mean? It doesn't mean forgive and forget. Allah was rebuking him for threatening to withdraw the livelihood that Abu Bakr was. Allah was telling him, continue doing the action. Don't withdraw it. Forgiveness is not about reconciling it only in your heart. It's about showing the action. And one of the ayahs that always throws the curveball for me about the idea of the way you show gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ayah do actions to show your thankful to, thankfulness to Allah and this is where the terrifying thing for me comes and why I hold strong to these interpretations because when I was 19, 20 I, I wanted again 
I'd learned Surah Taha and then the brother learned Surah Taha so I couldn't have a one up on him. So I learned Surah Maryam and then he learned Surah Maryam. So I thought I'm going to go for a big one, Surah Al Imran. So when I did Surah Al Imran, you come across the verse, you know, Rabbana la tuzih qulubana ba'da idha daytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahma innaka antal wahhab. The people who say that are Ulul Al Bab. So this isn't an ordinary Muslim saying it. They are Ulul Al Bab, they are people who know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are people, they are ibadah. You know, they are thinking of Allah standing, sitting, lying down. They are looking at the heavens, you know, and they're saying, Rabbana ma khalaqta. Like, we're not talking about people who, you know, miss Fajr sometimes. We're talking about people who dedicate their life to ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their conclusion is, Rabbana la tuziqulubana ba'da tha daytana. Allah, please do not take us out of the deen after you have guided us. Now, imagine me as a 19 year old. Alhamdulillah, I've never had an issue with prayer ever. With Sunnah, Alhamdulillah, no problem. But the point is, imagine my reaction that somebody pious, close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the dua they're making, that Allah, please don't take us out of the deen, suggesting that they're aware that Allah, that being Muslim is, a, is, is not a right, it's a privilege. It's something Allah gave you as a mercy. And if Allah gave it to you as a mercy and it's not a right, Allah can equally take that away. The way you keep something is by showing gratitude. How do you show the gratitude? You show the gratitude through the action. And that's why I fear that one of the reasons that many Muslims don't mobilize is because they sort of look at their Islam as something that's guaranteed. I can just coast through life and I will get to Jannah after I die. And I think that that's an inaccurate interpretation of how Islam should be. I think that if you are Muslim, there are obligations with it to act. And if you fail to show those obligations, there is the terrifying scenario where Allah says, I gave you the deen, I gave you the mercy, I gave you the blessings, but you did nothing with it. You interpreted it as doing nothing and simply staying home. And the, to emphasize this, when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, says, Ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qabli ala deenik, Ya oh you who flip the hearts, keep my heart on the deen. That's a prophet saying it. That's a prophet. You know, that's one of those where you think, yo, if a prophet is saying that, imagine what it means for somebody like me. And I think that when you have that mentality, that urgency, that I need to show gratitude for the mercy Allah bestowed upon me, at that point, I'll be honest, I'm no longer concerned about the outcome. I move because I'm terrified that Allah might think that I'm being ungrateful. I move and I mobilize, not because I believe I can truly make the change. I move and I mobilize because I'm terrified. So if you don't like the carrot, there's also the stick behind you. That if I don't show gratitude for what Allah gave me, Allah might take it away from me. And that's a terrifying prospect. And I think that's why Sahaba used to weep because they understood how fragile the, the deen was in their hearts. Not because they didn't believe, but because they acknowledge it's not a right. It's a mercy and rahmah from Allah. And we are obliged to show thanks for that mercy through the actions that we take. One of our teachers here, he'd say, he's a convert. He'd say, one thing he'd say is, first of all, I didn't convert. I uh, don't say convert, con revert, convert. He's like, but all those is nonsense. First, I submitted. That's number Allah. one. And he said, the other one is people are like, oh, I'm so proud to be a Muslim. Like, pride. Pride is how you get to hell. <laughs> you, 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 you should be thankful. So you're thankful to be a Muslim because this is not, this is a gift. This it is, is not. a gift. Well, it, it's, tr it's truly a gift. And I think what Palestine and Gaza, what, what, what the events in Gaza have shown, in my opinion, I think it's in, in some ways, you know, Gaza is saving us, showing a mercy on us. Because what Gaza did was, it forced us into mobilization. And what it did is, is that now that we've seen the effects of our mobilization, because let's be brutally honest, the reason there's a ceasefire hostage is not because of any Muslim governments, it's because public opinion resulted in a fall in the polls in the US, which led Biden to tell the Americans, according to CNN, that you no longer have months, you probably don't even have weeks. It's the public opinion that led the hostages to go, the families of the hostages in Tel Aviv, to surround Netanyahu's house, and demand that Netanyahu now take the hostage seriously. Public opinion is what is what shifted that. What Gaza has is why Gaza have shown mercy on us is that they've shown us that when we mobilize, Allah does amplify it. Let's be brutally honest. Objectively, all we did was retweet and share. But Allah amplified that. It's Allah who amplified it and caused it. Because when we took the one step, He took ten. So the question here is this: Now that Allah has reminded us, and that's a mercy, reminded us mm. that if we move, we can make a difference. I think the gratitude should be how can we advance and channel that mobilization into something that is lasting. And that's what I meant earlier in terms of how do we move forward? Allah gave you power to affect the elections or it might be something to do with the community or it might be you know, advancing greater cooperation between the masajid or it might be in the case of there was a school that um, I met some of the parents. There's a school that sent out an email in support of Israel in the beginning and for three weeks they lobbied. They said, why? It's a school. Like, you know, we're going to make our kids feel unsafe. And Allah sent them a Jewish ally, mashallah, and she spoke very strongly. And the school went back to a neutral statement. And so the parents were like, you know, what should we do now? Should we walk out the school? Should we put more pressure? And, and you know, you were like, no, but it's fabulous, you know, you won, you got the victory already. 
This superintendent is going to be, you know, his hand, his power over your children over the next six, seven years. You don't need an enemy in that position. Go take him Baklawa and win him. I say it was nothing personal. You know, we, we want to build ties. We want to, you know, even these little things, people are thinking about the grand scale of change. But even these little things, engagement with your schools, you know, engagement with your societies. One of the reasons that we were taken aback is because our lack of engagement with the communities meant that we were unable to build the protective walls that we needed to prevent them coming after us in those situations. When Allah says, that, that prepare yourselves uh, in defense against them as much as you can. Allah doesn't say, مَسْتَطَعْتُمْ meaning within the limits, within your capacity that you have. So if all you can do is engage with your schools to ensure they don't bully your children over Palestine and Gaza, do it. it, it's not a waste. And that's why, and the reason I say that is because somebody asked me and said, you know, I listen to you and I think, yeah, I want to do something, but I don't know what. And the reality is, is because everybody has their own environment in which they can do something. You don't have to be on the grand scale. It can be a simple case of engaging with your local schools and councils. And that's why I think that, you know, going back to this idea of gratitude, Alhamdulillah, think about it. Allah has blessed us with this deen, blessed us with hidayah, blessed us with the seerah that gives us examples, and blessed us with the Qur'an that reminds us constantly that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there and that he's in charge of the outcome. To show gratitude, we should mobilize and move forward. I just want to add to your point about um, the superintendent. Should we, <coughs> should we uh, hmm. get rid of him? And you said, no, actually, maybe treat him with some kindness. Hmm. Uh, this actually reminds me of all the scenes we've been seeing of the hostage releases, right? Because the way ha the way Hamas is dealing with these hostages, you know, they could be very well dealing with somebody that is actually in their occupied home. They occupied their home, and now th they're a hostage in their territory. And now they're releasing these hostages, and these hostages look like they're happy. They're 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 at Shalom peace, alaykum. right? <laughs> Like there was this meme going around, like find you, find you, uh, find you a wife, like you know that looks at you like this girl looks at her Hamas captor or something, <laughs> right? Because she just looked like she was so enamored, yeah. right? Um, but, but 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 here's the thing that I always say to people. Here's yeah. Here's the thing that I always say. What is dearer to you, that your enemy goes to hellfire, or that your enemy becomes Muslim and guided? See, this is, this is the twist ending that people don't think about for Gaza. Yeah, which is which is dearer to you? The yeah. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he entered Mecca. Remember, he entered as a conqueror, like his army there, he had finally won against Abu Sufyan. He chooses not to take revenge on any of them. Yeah. And not only that, Allah, he doesn't even just forgive them, he, he, he employs them. Amr ibn al-As becomes governor of Egypt. Yeah. Muawiyah, the son of Abu Sufyan, becomes governor of Syria. Suhail ibn Amr, who had mocked the Prophet Muhammad so at the so Treaty right. of Hudaybiyyah, when Ali ibn Abi Talib wrote Muhammad Rasulullah, and Suhail ibn Amr said, Rasulullah, Ya Muhammad, if we thought you were Rasulullah, ma qawmna, we would not have resisted your fault to you. Remove this. And Ali ibn Talib was so angry, he says, I'm not removing it. The Prophet said, we write Muhammad bin Abdullah. But the point is that Suhail ibn Amr is the one who, when the Prophet died and Quraysh thought about leaving the deen, Suhail ibn Amr is the one who stood on the Kaaba and said, Ya Quraysh, we were the last to enter. Will you have people laugh at us by saying we're the first to leave? So Allah used those very people and, and, and made them tools and assets in Islam, and we celebrate them today, like Khalid ibn Walid, who is the one who led the horsemen behind Uhud. We celebrate the examples of when the enemy becomes the Muslim, or when the enemy becomes guided. But the question here is this, why do we celebrate it when we read the stories, but don't manifest it in the actions that in which we conduct ourselves yeah. with the people that we, with the, that, that we conduct ourselves in? And I think it's these things that I call, and, and I speak of myself, I'm not, I'm, not passing, I'm not saying this is you or anybody else watching, but, but for me, it exposes my own subconscious hypocrisies that I celebrate what I don't employ in my own thinking. No. And, you know, I mean, we, uh, honestly, we have to consider it's a, I mean, if you look at history, the Mongols invaded, destroyed the Muslim Ummah as much as they could. And then what happened a generation later? Mass conversion. <laughs> and, they took it, and, and the winter took Islam back. Yeah. And that's why I think that one of the. And who was our greatest ally when we did it? The, gr the grandson. And, and, and that's why I think that one of the things that is, that is quite fascinating is, and this is what I meant in that, I think the greatest tragedy of colonization was not actually the physical colonization itself. It's what colonization did in terms of the way it cut our memories of the ummah from each other. Because for example, we're very rich in memories. This is what I meant, when you go to Bosnia and you see the struggle, you can't say the ummah is looking bleak. You're saying the ummah is winning because for Yugoslavia, communism and Serbia and Islam is still thriving there and the like. When you go to Turkey, for whatever problems Erdogan might have, he's the product of the Muslim movement since the 1920s, reading Quran in private and trying to get their people into the system and trying to engage, getting Adnan Mendes in 1960s, surviving military coups, many people being executed, many people being tortured. But they kept going, they kept going, they kept going. 1996, 1997, Erbakan becomes prime minister. They're finally breaking through. Erbakan is toppled in a military 
military coup because they accuse him of Islamizing sake. Then Erdogan comes and it's like, boom, straight out of the system. They finally broke that glass ceiling after 90 years of juhud, of striving and the like. And Erdogan has transformed Turkey. You can't say that they're losing. They're winning. They, you know, they spent struggling and striving and they're winning. You can't say the Ummah is losing. When Algeria got its independence after 132 years, 32 years of French rule, the reason the French were so upset is because they said, how is it 132 years? And we've shown them French values. We've shown them what the French are like. We brought the civilizing mission, but they won't let go of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They won't let go of these Arabs and Turks who colonized them. They won't let go of this message that entered their hearts. Why are they shouting on independence? Ya Muhammad Mabruk Aliq, Al Jazair Rajat Liq. Oh Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, congratulations, Algeria has been returned to you. It's the way Islam penetrates the hearts. And I think in that example itself, is a rebuke for the Ummah itself. Because we say that the Ummah looks bleak, but Islam is the fastest growing religion. It's as if Allah is saying that you might not be taking action and you might think the Ummah is looking bleak, but I'm guiding more and more people to the deen, more and more Americans becoming Muslim. You saw on TikTok, there was that girl in the beginning of the conflict where she said, I want to know where to get their resilience. I'm going to open the Quran. Three weeks later, she became Muslim and I saw her with Haifa Yunus uh, in, in, in a picture. Here in California. <laughs> no, but really, but you look how Allah SWT is saying, Ya Ibadallah, I don't need you to to spread the deen. Yeah. You are not the ones honoring me. I honor you by allowing you to choose to be the vehicle. And I think that's the terrifying part. Because Yunus alayhi salam left his people and then, you know, in frustration when he came back, he found them guided. You know, that's Allah saying, you know, yeah. really, I don't need... And I think that when it's you a... when you appreciate that, I think, I think, what you end up doing is you say, Alhamdulillah for where we are. Alhamdulillah for what our forefathers did. Alhamdulillah they won battles that I don't have to fight today. Today, this is my time to fight these battles to make sure the generation that comes after me don't have to fight them. I may not see the conclusion that I want, but I'll enjoy the ride while I go because Allah has honored me for being the vehicle to get there. Yeah, it's spreading on it's spreading on TikTok, which is run by China who hate Muslims somehow. It, it, it's incredible what vehicles right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses. No, really, it is. Uh, seriously, I, th I, and I never completed the point, but our generation, because of this entitlement and quick reaction thing, there is no striving for a lot of us. They call it like the, uh, deadbeat men and we're just like, oh, I'm working on it. What are you doing with your life? Oh, I'm figuring it out. I'm starting a business. I'm starting a side hustle. And they don't have like a real striving because we're so results oriented. That's everything has to be practical. Oh, that's not practical. Where, what are you going to do with that? What are you going to do with the whatever poli side degree, whatever you got, right? That, these questions come up. And because people are, I mean, a previous generation, like you said, like your dad, I want to go to the Himalayas. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I strove and struggled for you to get this XYZ degree. Our generation, I think a reason we're so narrow-minded, so pessimistic is because, first of all, our generation is not used to striving. We have not had to work hard <laughs> a day in our lives. And then the other way, and then, then that informs the way we look at politics and the world and the ummah. And like, oh my God, what the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever That's says it. the ummah is destroyed, two interpretations. Yeah. He's destroyed them or he's the most destroyed of them. Mm -hmm. So there's both ways. You are manifesting that energy, you know, this negative energy to the whole ummah, depressing everyone, or Allah saying, actually, you're the one who, or the Prophet is saying, you're the that's one same. who's been destroyed. Uh, yeah. it's, it, uh, and that's why I think that if you change the perspective, at the end of the day, Prophet ﷺ managed to transform the Sahaba in one generation. And people say, is that possible today? I think it's possible today because a lot of it is a matter of perspective first and foremost. Mm. And I think it, a lot of it is about altering the perspective. And I think that sometimes, you know, one of the things that I found quite fascinating is if you look at the end of the seerah, the Prophet ﷺ in Khutbat al-Wada'a has the chance to convey the conclusion of his message. Because he, he acknowledges, he says, you know, I may not stand here again after this, after today. And you'd think, I thought, you know, as a naive teenager reading it, and this is why I always say as a teenager when you read it, because teenager, you can be a bit brazen in the way you conclude certain things and get away with it. So I'd be like, what's he going to say? Go out and conquer Al-Quds. Go out and do this. Take your armies and go and carry the flag. You know, things like that. Yeah. And uh, instead, he just reminds them, he goes, إِنَّ دِمَاءَكُمْ وَأَمْوَالَكُمْ وَعَرَضَكُمْ حَرَمٌ عَلَيْكُمْ كَحُرْمَةِ يَوْمِكُمْ هَذَا فِي شَرِكُمْ هَذَا فِي بَلَدِكُمْ هَذَا Your blood, honor and property are sacred to each other. So look after it. Don't let people abuse it. In terms of revenge, I let go of the blood feud between me and this other tribe. And I urge you all to do the same. I urge you all to look after your neighbors. I urge you. All. It's all things that the ummah should be doing between themselves. Now, the question here is this. Why did the Prophet ﷺ use these? And many people interpret that again in the spiritual way because it makes you feel good. But I actually think it's very political. Because when you consider, for example, that, you know, you stand up for each other in the community, you protect each other's honor in the community, you come to each other's aid. Imagine what it feels like to be able to move forward knowing your community has your back. Imagine what it feels like to know that if you buckle, your community will tell you, don't worry about it, get back up, we're still with you, move forward, that you make your Tawbah repentance, move forward, go, keep doing the good that you're doing in your society. Imagine what kind of community that creates. Imagine what kind of community it creates when Amr ibn Asr said, 
that the Prophet ﷺ used to treat me in such a way that I was convinced I was the dearest person to Prophet Muhammad. And then he makes the mistake of asking him. <laughs> he went to Prophet ﷺ and he says to him, who's the dearest person? He said, Aisha. He said, amongst the men, her father. And after Abu Bakr, Umar al Khattab. And he said, the more I kept asking, the more I realized my name was not there. But the point of the hadith is the way Prophet used to make used to make people feel. You know, even in these little things. When you consider, people think, okay, I should make people feel good. No, the reason Amr ibn al-As put his life on the line for Islam and the Prophet Wasallam, who he had fought before and opposed, the way Prophet Wasallam won his heart so wholeheartedly that he went and took Islam to Egypt is because of the way Prophet Wasallam treated it. It was a political thing just as much as it was a spiritual thing. It was about winning people's hearts so that they fight with you for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that they believe in the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you know, Alam tara kayfa darab Allah mathalan, mathalan kalimatan tayyibatan ka shajaratin tayyibat. Have you not seen how Allah has given the example of the good word as a tree its branches are high and its roots are deep and it has all the seasonal fruits people read it and say okay yes say, say nice words but look at how Allah describes it deep roots because it's the, it establishes the roots in the community and the society why did the Prophet Sallallahu say Afshu salama baynakum say salam alaykum when, you, when I walk down the street and I say a Muslim and you know usually you look eye contact eye contact eye contact salam alaykum wa alaykum as salam and you, even if you don't know them you, it's pleasant when you walk in for example you know through a door and someone says salam alaykum I do it with my daughter I said to my daughter once, she said, Baba, is it true? Like all Muslims are like brothers and sisters. I took her to a Somali cafe. I said, Selma, walk in and say, Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. She walked in, Salam alaikum. And the whole cafe, Wa alaikum, Salam alaikum. <laughs> and she loves it. She walks in groups of Muslims just because she loves the effect. She walks in, she's eight now. She walks in, she goes, Salam alaikum. And she loves the way everybody automatically responds because it gives her a thrill. It gives her that sense of belonging. You think it's just spiritual, but that's how you build the community that stands by you and ends up mobilizing. It's and it's omatic. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu chose that for his final khutbah yeah. because that's how you build a community that lends it. And that's why, and I'll finish on this point, in, in Badr when the Muslims promise. went out, I promise, I promise. <laughs> the Prophet Sallallahu when he goes out in Badr, there's nothing wrong with asking your community to back you. When the Prophet Sallallahu mobilized and, moved and went out, before he went to the battlefield, he turns around and he says, Ashiru alayya, and the Ansar and Sa'ad Mu'ad says, as if you're asking us, Ya Rasulullah as if you want to know if we're ready to go with you or And he said, yes, I want to know. So even the Prophet ﷺ needed the reassurance from Ansar. And I think sometimes when it comes to the community, I think we need to consider. Who, should we th Consider how we can support those who are making the effort. And if they buckle along the way, are we a community that says, okay, you made a mistake, but don't worry, get back up. Keep going, son. I got you. Don't worry. Like, or are we a community that says, oh, the better, the better, and you condemn them you know, forever and you, and you bring down all the good that they do. And I think that the Ummah has power. It's always had power. The reason it's being repressed is because there's concern over the power that it might be able to manifest. And the only reason you're not seeing that power at the moment is because there's a lack of striving. And that's why on every podcast, somebody made a, made a joke on Twitter. They said, you know, Sammy says the same thing in every single interview, but just in different ways. But I like it. I say it's true because the Quran has been there 1400 years with the same message. And it is as relevant today as it's been 1400 years. Ya yeah, Allah. <laughs> well, I think actually this is a good point. We can summarize the points that were brought up and then we can go into part two. <laughs> <laughs> if they'll tolerate this. You know, you know, you know, you know stuff like it's, it's, it's weird. So, so sometimes I get criticized. It's true. I speak quite quickly. It is true. And, and I remember my father when, when, when he saw me once on my first interview, Al Jazeera English. So I went home and I said, Baba, how was it? He goes, My son, I have a question. He said, well, Why do you talk like somebody's chasing after you? <laughs> Why can't you be you become? You know, I don't know. I just feel like. <laughs> it's okay. I get the same criticism. Has, uh, same criticism. Just do minus zero point seven five. Uh, whoever's. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the passion, mashallah, <laughs> coming through. You know. I mean, I'll, I'll, how about this? I can end it on. You can. You want to summarize? I have one. I think we can end it on. It's not. I, I not necessarily summarize the whole thing. I just wanted to bring about the main points, which is uh, one of the first ones was, uh, you know, reframe, right? Uh, don't don't be pessimistic. When you look at the when you look at the situation, reframe it into a positive thing. So, for example, I, I brought up the, you know, the Muslim politicians and how it's always been this way. And then Sammy countered with, "Well, why don't you think of it as a a recent phenomena that can easily change, Inshallah. right?" So, reframe your your idea. The second thing was the movement. Constantly keep moving, even if the goal is even if the result is not readily available to you. Just the movement itself. There's but 
الحركة بركة أيوة الحركة فيها بركة You know, yes, you know where yes. that's from, yes, right? Yes, These are from yes. the, the Senate guys You saw them at no. the <laughs> <That's> <laughs> My brother-in-law says it all the time Yeah, yeah. الحركة بركة There's right? always so بركة in movement There's بركة in movement right? There's blessings in movement <laughs> So even and, and, and also, by the way There's also كل تأخيرة فيها خيرة If there is a delay in the outcome There is blessing in it There is good in it Even if it doesn't come when you want it to Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah so I think we can summarize the entire the framework based on you know those those uh, those two points, um, and I think Munir had one more point before. Yeah, we go. I, I mean, just there's such optimism in that striving because you're not when you're not looking for an end goal, you're just going to keep moving because I don't care where this ends up. All I know is I'm acting according to Quran Sunnah framework, which is I think extremely important for the Muslims to remember. Like mm-hmm. this is how we want all are striving to be. We don't want it to be. Yeah. Like those who strive, literally they're, they're striving, Allah uses the same word, was wasted in this life. Mm-hmm. Zionist 101. But to end it, this whole striving thing, how does Allah speak of the reward of that? In Surah Al-Sana, as we were mentioning, He says, mm-hmm. Their Rabb pours for, himself is the one pouring the drinks for the people in Jannah. So this is a reward beyond you know, imagination. Mm. And that's all. And Allah, right after that, He says, because their striving was thanked. This and, is and, and, and to end it on this point as well, some, uh, you know when somebody said to me, okay, Sam, you've said all this in the striving, but don't you really, do you really not envisage any outcome? And I said to them, yes, I do envisage an outcome. My ideal outcome, the outcome that I long for, that I dream for, that I long for, is that at the moment of my death, when my soul goes up, the angels say, Ya ayyatuhan nafs al-mutma'inna, irji'i ilay rabbiki radiyatan mardi. I plead with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honestly that after everything, that after everything, I don't mind that I don't see an outcome in this dunya because the only outcome, and I say this sincerely, but the only outcome I want is that when my soul leaves my body, the angels say, Ya ayyatuha nafs al mutma'inna, irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiya, fadkhuli fi ibadi, wadkhuli jannati. At that moment, I'll know I've won. It doesn't matter what I've left behind in this dunya. I will know that I've won, that that's it, it's over. That's the outcome for me. The, I don't see an outcome in this dunya, but I know the outcome on the other side, which is that Jannah. That's what I want. I know, and to get there, Allah will not tell me, change the whole world. And Allah will say, use the powers that you have in this dunya. I'll decide the outcome, but show me you want to strive, and I promise to give you Jannah. So if anybody does say that all of this discussion has been so what we're supposed to do, all this with no outcome, no, there is an outcome. The outcome is that Jannah, inshallah, and Allah makes us from the people of Jannah, inshallah. Inshallah, I mean, Allah may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala empower us to use the blessings He gave us for the good of Islam and the spreading of Islam in the name of Allah. Amen. 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 Yeah. So, we're not ending yet. <laughs> <laughs> we still got a little bit. Of, we got a little bit more. Um, so, like on the prophetic mentality podcast, we always try to have, like we said, evergreen conversations. You can listen to this mm. conversation three years from now, five years from now, it'll still be relevant. Uh, we don't really talk too much about current events, but this is a very important moment right now, pivotal. So, we do want to get your opinion on the ceasefire, the ongoing ceasefire right now. Where do you think it's going to go? Um, do you think this could continue? Like it may be a prolonged situation and they may have some sort of additional negotiation or do you think this is just a pause on some very big massacre? I'm waiting for the to... false flag Hamas attack us yeah. first where they end well, what the I will say first and foremost, what I will say first and foremost is you've asked a question that a few clients have asked and that the clients are paying and you're not paying. But, <laughs> so after this podcast goes out... You didn't have to tell them. Uh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> so after this podcast goes out, no client is going to come to me to ask the question. But anyway, regardless, yeah, let's do, do you want a, Do you want a night answer? No, 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 I'll ask. I'll ask. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put it behind a paywall. No, but, but, I, but, but Jin, just so people know about what the industry is like, this is genuinely a question that is posed by clients. But to answer this question, and, and we'll put the political analyst hat on, the reason the truce has come about is because Netanyahu is under pressure domestically and Biden is under pressure domestically. Before they didn't want the truce, so they implemented it, which means they've been forced into a truce. They're forced into a situation that they don't want, suggesting that what Netanyahu wants is a return to the military operations. The reason he can't return to the military operations is because of that domestic pressure. When Blinken went to Netanyahu to propose the humanitarian pause, Axios reported that Blinken told Netanyahu, help us to help you, because your atrocities is turning public opinion, but also that Netanyahu said to Blinken that I need to know that this humanitarian pause is, quote, not a plan from Biden to lure me into a ceasefire, mm. suggesting that we think their hearts are united, but قلوبهم shatta. The reason why I mention that is it does appear that it, with the extension of the ceasefire now for two days, before I entered in here and, and a, a few hours ago, I saw the news has been extended for two days. It does appear 
that this might be a situation that leads to a permanent ceasefire. Again, al-ghaybu and Allah. But I think the dynamics do suggest that there is a move towards a permanent ceasefire. And one of the ways that the reason I say that is because Ben Gvir, the right-wing ally of Netanyahu, is loudly condemning the truce and the hostage exchange because he believes that this means that there will not be a military operation after this truce. The second point worth noting is that <coughs> the times of Israel, when the elderly hostages were released by Hamas, the Times of Israel reported two weeks ago, you can find this on Google actually, um, they reported that Netanyahu and the IDF were, quote, frustrated and annoyed that the hostages were being released because it would reduce, it would threaten the support for a military operation in Gaza. suggesting that if the hostages are released, Israel will not have the international support to continue a military operation. The third dynamic worth noting here is that there is increasingly loud voices now from Israeli allies that have turned against Israel. The BBC itself actually reported, BBC Wama Adrak, reported and said that the, in, the international allies of Israel genuinely believe that they're now at a stage where they will permanently lose their ability to win support from the global south and lose public opinion because everybody can see the double standards. So David Cameron, the new foreign minister of the UK, has now come out criticizing Israel and what it's doing. The deputy prime minister of Belgium is calling for sanctions. Macron has already called for a ceasefire. Spain has said it's ready to recognize a Palestinian state. And we're already seeing the Saudis, who ideally want to have normalization, but find themselves being forced now to increasingly criticize the Israelis. All of that suggests that the window of opportunity for Israel to return to military operations is now closing. And that's why I think, and I could be wrong, I think that the dynamics suggest that it is more likely that this will end up a permanent unofficial ceasefire. By unofficial, I mean if you look at Yemen, for example, there's no official ceasefire between the Houthis and the Saudis, but there hasn't been fighting for a year and a half or two years. They may, and the reason why is Saudi doesn't want to sign a deal that legitimizes the Houthis, but doesn't want to fight. And the Houthis don't want to fight, so they've accepted the ceasefire. It may well be that we will see extension after extension after extension, not because the Israelis think they will go back to military operations, but because the Israelis do not want to be humiliated into recognizing Hamas by signing a permanent ceasefire. So there will be a de facto ceasefire and the debate will shift to what do we do in Gaza? Do we bring the Palestinian Authority? Do we recognize Hamas again? And I think the final thing worth noting is that Netanyahu's party in the Knesset, in the parliament, is trying to pass a bill to accelerate the establishment of settlements in northern Gaza. The reason they're pushing the bill to accelerate it suggests that they're racing against time in order to try to entrench the gains that they've made, suggesting there's a concern it could be reversed, which suggests that there is a sentiment that the military operation to further make gains is no longer an option, so let's entrench what we've already had. So all of those are, are simply signs, you know, you're assessing what's happening in the news, but I think it's more likely that the de facto ceasefire will continue. The Qatari foreign, minist foreign ministry spokesman, Lulu al Khatar is in Gaza at the moment as well, which suggests that the Qataris and the official presence there suggest they believe certainly that there will be a prolonged ceasefire. So the direct answer to your question is, I think there is a good chance there will be a prolonged ceasefire. I think that Netanyahu is uncomfortable with it, but has very limited room to maneuver. Okay. So the, their only option is, well, to make the gains, because part of the ceasefire is that anyone who went south can't go back north, mm. right? So they're going to resettle there, or not resettle, they're going to settle there, and then you know Benjamin Netanyahu will try to do whatever he can to salvage his party. And I think one of the, w the reasons that that is becoming a hot topic is because Biden has suggested that Israel should not reoccupy Gaza and that there shouldn't be settlements yeah. in northern Gaza. And I think that now what's happening is that as public opinion increases the pressure, I think there's increasing divergence in terms of what the end result should be between the Americans and the Israelis. Yeah. Because Biden, according to Politico, and even and Erdogan also said it as well, there is a growing sense among Israel allies that nobody wants Netanyahu in power after all this is finished. That Benny Gantz is expected to take over over Netanyahu and that Biden has made clear to Netanyahu, I don't want you there. Also, the presence of William Burns, the head of the CIA, for those who don't know in the political field, when Blinken is in charge of something, that's like a first attempt by diplomatic officials. When William Burns gets on a plane, that's when the big boys come out. That's when something serious is in. And this ceasefire actually came about after William Burns left Washington to go negotiate it, suggesting that there's a view that Blinken messed up and Blinken has been messed and there is, they're no longer tolerating the nonsense that he's doing. And I think that in that particular context, it may well be that now the polls in Israel, I think two days ago, they, they suggested that Netanyahu and his, and his entire alliance would lose any elections that are held today. I think that Netanyahu now is facing an existential threat to his own political future. 
And I think that it appears that as public opinion increases and Biden gets increasingly in trouble, I think that will only increase the divergence between the Americans and the Israelis. Having said that, that's a good thing. Having said that, I don't think I don't think Biden will come out openly and say I've turned against the Israelis, but we will see that sort of soft that that pressure behind the scenes. And I think that and for anybody who says no, I think they'll be returned to war. Again, I go back to that point. The fact we have a hostage truce when Netanyahu is adamantly refusing means that pressure has been brought to bear that forced him into a situation that he did not want, which means there is a force that is in operation at the moment forcing the Israelis to buckle. I think that's public opinion. That's why I think everybody should keep shouting loud and keep roaring about the issue of Palestine and keep highlighting it. And I think the Americans now are hoping, given that November is next year, they're hoping let's end this so that Muslims have one year to forget so that they will go and vote Democrat again. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Munir, do you want anything else to add? Yeah, just I'm curious. Let's say uh, Bibi is replaced. Does that change what happens? I mean, what, what happens to Gaza? I mean, put it that way. Like, what happens now that you have a, half the population displaced? How do things go back to normal on a besieged <laughs> country like that? I think that? I think that at the moment there are a number of ideas that are being touted. The first is that an Arab force goes in and acts as a peacekeeping force in Gaza. CC suggested that they will demilitarize Gaza and CC will offer to keep the Palestinians chained on behalf of the Israelis uh, in exchange and, and keep them there so that they don't threaten the Israelis again. I don't know to what extent Egypt will actually allow this. The UAE, the suggestions that the UAE suggested an Arab force could also be placed there, but the Jordanian foreign minister has come out and said, we will not accept any international forces, Arab or non-Arab, in Gaza. The Palestinian Authority, Mahmoud Abbas, is worried that he will seem to be complicit with the Israelis if he takes over Gaza, so he's reluctant to send the Palestinian Authority over there. Hamas, if you look at the hostage exchange, a lot of their forces, uh, or the images coming out, is from the north. So Hamas making a statement that while they've bombarded and carpet bombed the north, Hamas are still there. Hamas is making that statement to say that we're not as defeated or weak as you think we are. I think all of those dynamics suggest that there is no clear plan as to what happens to Gaza afterwards or who should rule Gaza. And that's why I think that we'll go through sort of this sort of stalemate where everybody tries to present ideas but struggles to implement any of those particular ideas. That chaotic status quo leaves room for a lot of tension and potentially another war. What I will say, even though it sounds like I said a lot of words but didn't say anything at all, the, the reason, what, what I will say is that these dynamics and this uncertainty is a stark contrast to the situations before. Before you could say that the Israelis and the Americans were firmly in control. The fact that we're speaking in such uncertain language is in and of itself a new development in that it shows how much the dynamics have changed, that these powers are no longer in this, have this overwhelming control whereby they can dictate what happens next. The fact you pose that question, what happens next in Gaza, and that no one can answer it, shows the extent to which the Israeli and US grip on the narrative of the conflict and the future of the conflict has been weakened over the years by what the Palestinians have done in terms of activism or the like. That's a positive in and of itself. I think that when it comes to something tangible about where Gaza and Palestine go from here, the blunt answer is I don't know. But the most precise answer is that if you look at history, I think this may well be the turning point for two reasons. The first is clear that we're going through a period of the Great Awakening. Public opinion has shifted so far in favor of the Palestinians everywhere, including amongst those who supported Israel. It's hard to imagine Israel ever winning that back. There was a Times article, the Times being one of the most prominent papers in the UK, which said that Israel is losing friends and fast. And we also saw here in the Hill last week where they said that Netanyahu has done such damage to Israel's image and Israel has lost public opinion to such an extent that we may not be, that our allies, the, he's speaking, quote, our allies may not rush to Israel's aid again in future. And the second point here, aside from the public opinion and the Great Awakening, is that one of the things, and perhaps this lends itself to the point I made earlier, and that people say, you know, where do you get your knowledge or whatever from? It, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sometimes brings knowledge at the right time. I, one month ago, was just suddenly curious in finding a writer sympathetic to colonization to see how they view Algeria's colonization. So I found a historian, Alistair Thorne, who writes a book about Algeria's independence. And in it, he says, if only the French had done this, they could have stayed. If they did this, they could have. But I wanted to read it to see how they view the world. And one of the quite fascinating things, he, he marks two developments in the Algerian liberation movement that led to liberation. The first, he says, 
was Abd al-Hamid bin Badis and his establishment of the Jamiyat Ulama al-Muslimin, the Council of Islamic Scholars. He says the reinvigoration of the Islamic schools across the country produced a generation that could speak fluent Arabic, that had an Islamic understanding of the worldview, and they formed the bulk of the FLN that later emerged 30 years later. And the second point he said was 1945, when France was liberated from Nazi Germany, when they were writing in the Geneva Convention, every man is born free, France celebrated in Paris, and then Algerians, because they felt that they were going to be rewarded with freedom for their support to France in World War II and support for the Allies, Algerians in Stif, in Galma, and Kharata took to the streets. In that week, France killed 30,000 Algerians. The French say that book that I'm talking about, they say the French say 12,000. The Algerians say 50,000, so I've gone for the halfway point, 30,000. So they killed 30,000 in one week. That historian writes that the French were convinced that that massacre ended the resistance of the Algerians. They wouldn't dare to resist again. But he argues that that massacre was so great that it changed international support for France and it also changed the Algerian sentiment towards the need to finally take to the, to, to the ground and actually turf, and, and turf the French. The point being is the turning point was a tragic massacre in the same way that this tragedy might be the turning point for Palestine. Okay. Inshallah. Alhamdulillah. It just seems like there's no way back. Like we can't just stop like 2014 or but the, but the world never goes back I, I, sometimes people always talk about a return to the status quo yeah, there but is look, no status quo but uh, there is I mean 90 years ago this world was under official colonization official yeah. then we had you know we had the, the 1973 oil embargo we had wrestling matches we had China and then the US and, and we had the Cold War we had the Iron Curtain East Germany West Germany 19, 1980s we had the war Iran Iraq and 1990s you have the Gulf War you have Sudan being put under sanctions you have so many things happening in the 2000s war and terrorism Afghanistan or the like 2010s you have whatever Brexit you have, nothing ever stays the world just keeps moving I think that those who keep talking about status quo I don't know what status quo they're talking the world keeps moving the water keeps flowing it's about whether you're ready to flow with the water and try to alter its course or whether you just get swept up in it and end up suffering through all the stones and rocks that are being carried in the water itself. Yeah, I think it's just hard to imagine what, what, what it looks like for the people living in Gaza. Like if they occupy the north and then it, you, the population density is twice as much now in an area that's completely... But have you seen it. their iman though? The, 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 it's extraordinary. I remember I saw... So, yeah. so I saw one Gaza shopkeeper where old old, old man... Bit of bit, few teeth missing, and he's sitting in his shop, and he goes, "Subhanallah!" They send two aircraft carriers, they send their planes, they send their ships. Then, عشان شنو؟ عشان غزة? Because of غزة? Wow! Are we that strong? <laughs> is is that how they? I saw, you know, somebody, his brother died, and he said, "Inna lillahi wa lillahi rajiun." My brother shaheed. Alhamdulillah. Hasbunallah wa lamaulakil. He goes straight, you know, to Jin. You see the way, and another man in the hospital shouting, "We don't cry, guys." Shuhada, shuhada. It's extraordinary yeah. the iman. Extraordinary. The iman that they are displaying, and an iman that, and, and I'm not arrogant enough to believe that I am better than anyone in any way. I honestly, truly, be, if I was in that situation, I don't know if I would say the same thing. I don't. I, I really yeah. don't. And you know, it goes back to this idea, even political analysis. The starting point is always, I don't know what I would do in that situation. So let me start by putting myself in those shoes. And often you find, honestly, like it, it's extraordinary. And I think, think about it. The reason people are entering Islam in this period that's supposed to be tragic and we're supposed to be defeated is because people are marveling at the resilience of the Palestinian Gaza. And for those who say, but this is a bit of a callous approach, given that a lot of people are dying, mm -hmm. I remind them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتَ بَلَا حِيَاءٌ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ يُرْزَقُونَ فَرِحِينَ بِمَا آتَاهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ وَيَسْتَبْشِرُونَ الَّذِينَ لَمْ يَلْحَقُوا بِهِمْ أَلَّا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَهُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ بِنِعْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَفَضْلٍ لَمْ يَمْسَسْهُمْ سُوءٍ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and it's, it's a prolonged ayah, it's an elongated ayah to really convince you and reaffirm that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, do not consider those who've died for the sake of Allah as dead, but they are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, happy with what he's giving them. And Allah says, and they call out to the rest of us. They are calling out to us and saying that they are happy with what Allah has given and they no longer feel pain or sadness and that they are celebrating what Allah has given them. Allah doesn't put them through limbo. They don't go through, go through a day of judgment. Automatic, boom, straight. They are with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. And I think now it's up to us who've been left behind to decide what we do because they got, alhamdulillah, straight to Jannah. We need to get there ourselves. So that's why we need to keep striving and keep moving. Inshallah. And Inshallah. I, I think... It, there's two points here. One, I don't think people know this, but as a percentage of a population, Gaza has the most hafad of when you take it percentage wise, like their population to the number of people. So that's one thing. Like, where's this iman coming from? It's like very Quran oriented community, very, very, very heavily. 
And another thing, this whole perspective thing, I mean, this ha- this whole situation has minimalized so many of the Western doubts that we have about, oh, uh, I, I was wondering, I mean, no one comes out of the rubble from Gaza and saying like, Alhamdulillah, say Alhamdulillah. He goes, well, you know, I was down there for a while and I thought to myself, why did the Prophet marry Aisha at the age he did? You know, like no one comes out with these, all these weird, these doubts that we have in the Western world. I mean, such, not even secondary, tertiary issues that somehow, some way, someone's losing their entire faith. No one in Gaza says, why would Allah let evil happen to us here? The, the problem evil. All of them coming out, Alhamdulillah, Subhanallah, Allahu Akbar, Shaheed, Shaheed, etc., etc. That's their framing of Islam and Iman, etc. Like really puts in perspective for the Western audience to really look at it and say like, what matters at the end of the day? I mean, these issues you think like, oh, I became atheist because of X, Y, Z. Really? Was that really worth it? Mm. Well, the guy being bombed and losing a leg or two says, Alhamdulillah, I'll go to Jannah if I'm, uh, have sabr on this. Like this mm. that really places people, like their mindset, and where they they should be No, thinking. it is a perspective. Which is why I think sometimes we in, we in the West, I'll be honest with you, we're in a very luxurious or privileged position in that. And this is what I meant in that sometimes when you travel to the other body parts of the ummah, because no. the ummah is one body, and you see what they've gone through, how they strived, how they never gave up, how Turkey now is more Muslim than it's been over the past 90 years because of the efforts of the Muslim community. How Erdogan won the last election, not because of the economy, but because the Muslim movement said, we're not compromising on our gains. We're continuing to protect our gains. We will fix Erdogan in our own way. We won't allow those who are nostalgic for our oppression to come back into power. Erdogan might have his faults, but we will fix our brother, not you. I think when you look at Bosnia, the way that the mosques now are getting increasingly full, they fought against communism. Or like. The reality is when I go to these countries and I see those struggles, or Uzbekistan, which is shaking off the Soviet chains, and now the mosques are filling up once more again as those restrictions are lifted because the Muslim community never said, never said no. They kept resisting under oppression, torture, and brutality. Let's be brutally honest. Like We're in a much better position. It doesn't compare to the struggles that the other parts of the Ummah did. And that's why I think that it is very strange that when you go to those countries, they don't tell you the Ummah is bleak. They tell you we keep going. But the people who live in better circumstances are the ones who are saying that the Ummah is bleak. And I think that's why sometimes I think it's about perspective and shifting those perspectives. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always in control. He knows what he's doing. Allah has given us a certain set of powers. Let's deploy it and leave the rest to him. Yeah, 2016, I think, was a tipping point. They mm. tried to take out Erdogan. Mm. And I think that's like the last time. And the people yeah. took the streets and said, no way. Yeah, mm. I think that's the, when the Western world woke up and it's like, maybe we can't play these games anymore. I mean, yeah, we're the, we're the community that, have you heard the Unmasked movement? Mm. Or the Unmasked like, documentary? Oh, no, no, he, that's, he's <laughs> so, in the UK. Yeah, man. yeah you guys we, are talking <laughs> over there. <laughs> yeah, this, this, uh, we got some clowns over that. here. Yeah, no, <laughs> so here, the people, this whole thing was, the, you'd go to the masjid and the auntie or the uncle is really mean to you, so you'd leave the masjid. Like, oh, huh. it's, not a, it's not an accepting environment for me. And wow. Yeah, like they tell you, you know, your hijab is improper or... You know, your beard's not long enough. The board whatever. is very strict, whatever else, right? They yeah. have no control. So you leave them. I don't go back to the masjid. And you're un- well, and quote, unquote, I, unmasked. I, I wow. have friends from Uzbekistan. I remember meeting like, what is this, like six, seven years ago? It's not even that long ago. He's telling us how they cannot go to the masjid because they keep track of who's going to Jum'ah every Friday. Uh, He's yeah. like, I have to go to a different mosque so they don't keep track of me going to the same mosque every now and then. Right? Are you saying they're, they're literally taking yeah. these Soviet shackles are still coming off. Even in a quote unquote Muslim country, they can't go to the masjid freely. Yeah. And they're trying to. They're going out of their way to figure out how do I go to a different measure every now and here. Like, oh, it's it's so tough. The, the I remember even in the Turkish <laughs> elections, like the, the night before the first round of the vote, usually Turkish presidents go to Atatürk's grave. Do you know to celebrate? Something. Yeah. You saw the scenes, Erdogan and Ayah Sophia, when he went there and everybody's there, you know, thousands of people making dua. That was, think about it, in the past 90 years, when did you see that in Turkey? That That's Erdogan going and, make, and making a statement that my victory will, will come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people are like, yeah, okay, it was, a, it was PR. It was a, that's irrelevant. The fact is that Erdogan believed that to win the election, he should go to the mosque and draw on the Islamic identity to ensure that he can win that election, not through Ataturk. That's a mighty shift in Turkey. And that's why I think that sometimes the t- people tend to focus on the buckles and the, and the trips that along the way, but they neglect the overarching trajectory and trend that is changing from 90 years ago being under official colonization to independence and liberation, to Arab Spring where we're threatening the authoritarian regimes. And now, yes, I know it's chaotic and there are wars, but chaos comes about when one power is unable to dominate the other. They used to dominate, but now they cannot. And that chaos is not because there's something wrong. It's because because now the power dynamics have been threatened, because the people are banging on the door to freedom, the repression is harder because the desire for freedom and the advances the Ummah is making is so strong and so bad that they're trying to repress that once more. I think that when people see the struggle, they view it as weakness. Whereas I'm saying 
that the harder the repression, the more success you are getting that requires a harder repression to push back against you. When you see them repressing harder, it's because they're concerned. A power is growing and manifesting and beginning to assert itself in a manner that requires a greater form of repression. So yes, it's getting harder, but that's because you're moving forward. And that's why I think that Martin Luther King has a lovely phrase. Mm -hmm. And I actually think it's a very Islamic phrase in which he says, you know, if you can fly, fly. If you can't fly, run. If you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. But by God, keep moving. You keep, keep moving, keep mobilizing. And I think that's the spirit that this ummah has. And that's why I think that those who aren't moving, I think that they're in the minority. I actually think that those who aren't moving, they are the ones who, the ummah in Bosnia, in Turkey, in Uzbekistan, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, and these, they're all mobilizing and Islam is growing. And we see in France, the Muslim community growing. We see in Europe, Muslim Islam being the fastest growing religion. Why do they talk, keep talking about Islamophobia and Muslims? Because more and more people are becoming Muslims. It's not because they're targeting. They, oh, they are perceiving it as a threat because more and more people are entering Islam. It's because the Muslims are getting stronger that the repression equally is getting stronger. And that's why I think it's all a matter of perspective. Because when you see it that way, you no longer feel despair. You feel, okay, if we are getting stronger and the repression, how can I reinforce my brothers and sisters in these places? And that's why part of, you know, I'd like to think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helped and enabled us to be here to come to America. And, 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 and I put it even today. I said, look, I, I thank Mass LA and those who brought me here to LA. But, you know, and I said to them, for giving me a chance to plead with the, with the Muslims here, the Ummah here, to change their perspective and to use the power that they have and to show them what the Ummah looks like through my eyes. Because the Ummah in my eyes looks strong, it looks capable, and it has power, and I'm pleading with them to use that power. Alhamdulillah, I think that's a great note to end the podcast on. Jazakallah khair, Sammy, for joining us this evening. Allah jazik barakallah. Wallahi, wallahi, it's, uh, it's, it's, been, it's been a pleasure. I'm, it's I'm, been, I'm it's been an honor, wallahi, to have you. Um, and uh, I think, well, just so you know, the reason you, I think you've resonated with so many people, not to push you up, I, I can put you down later, but. Yeah, yeah, put me down later, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but really, the reason is because we are so used to political talk being so divorced mm -hmm. from the Quran and Sunnah. We are so used to, there are, there are very few, pol quote unquote, politicians I can name off the top of my head. California, and so Cal, we have like one that gives khutbas here, and he, he's regular, but he's, you know, he's quote unquote, religious. The rest of them are so, you know, like the, the ones we were naming earlier. They just, they're so divorced from the Quran and you don't, they don't quote Quran anywhere. Even you're saying your own political analysis when you're talking to quote unquote non-Muslims, yeah. it's still in the back of your mind and you can frame it like Ibn Khaldun puts it in a great way and you use that framework to say, I can still take how the Quran teaches us and says there's a moral boundary here, but what does that moral boundary lead to? And that itself can be communicated to even a non-Muslim audience. So may Allah keep you on that. I mean, Quran, sure. your family be Ahl Quran, I mean, all of us, inshallah. Sami, I actually have a request. You, you can reject it if you'd like. But could you just end, if there's like a certain portion of the Quran that you you really uh, enjoy or like, they think is relevant, if you just recite it to end this off. A'udhu billahi mishtarajim. Inna fi khalqi s-samawati wal-ardi wa ikhtilafi l-layni wal-nahari la ayatin li uli al-albab. الذين يذكرون الله قياما وقعودا وعلى جنوبهم ويتفكرون في خلق السماوات والأرض ربنا ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار ربنا إنك من تدخل النار فقد أخزيته وما للظالمين من أنصار ربنا إننا سمعنا مناديا ينادي للإيمان أن آمنوا بربكم فآمنا ربنا فاغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتوفنا مع الأبرار ربنا وآتنا ما وعدتنا على رسلك ولا تخزنا ولا تخزنا يوم القيامة إنك لا تخلف الميعاد صدق الله العظيم بارك الله فيك بارك الله فيك This is Amr Mabruk with the Prophetic Mentality Podcast signing off السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته